Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of my interview with Jim Bennett, uh, author of A Faithful Reply to the CES Letter. Uh, this this uh, interview is kind of subtitled Believing After the CES Letter. We just did two and a half good hours with Jim Bennett. It's December 28th. I'm John DeLynn. And uh, we just spent, again, two and a half hours talking to Jim about God, about Jesus, about his about Jim's background, and about prophets and about faith and the role of the church. It was the type of conversation I've missed. It's the type of tussle that I would do with Dan Witherspoon and others. But I think it was a constructive, healthy, vibrant dialogue where I think we um, came to a lot of common ground. I think it was a healthy, constructive conversation. I'm happy with it, and I'm really thrilled uh, to have you back for part two. So, Jim Bennett, welcome to part two of our interview. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Yeah. So now it's time to turn to Joseph Smith and scripture and all that stuff. And this is stuff we could, you know, you, you obviously you already did 12 hours with Bill Real. I've promised to you and to my listeners, not that you required it, <laughs> but this isn't about debating. Right. This is about finding common ground and coming to understand how you believe, uh, knowing all the problems. That's what this is about. So let's, let's dig in. How does that sound? Sure. All right. Um, okay. So let's begin. And what I'll do is I'll lay out the, the correlated kind of orthodox understanding of a bunch of different issues. And then you can talk about, uh, you know, how you see things. Is that okay? But I'll set up kind of what I was taught or what I think the general understandings are and or what I think the problems are. And you can sort of say, yes, I yes, I agree to problems, you know, C, D, and E. I disagree with problems A, B, and R. Um, but then more, most importantly, you can say, here's how I believe Okay. Uh, regardless. Okay? okay. So we start with Joseph Smith. Um, kind of the the narrative that I think we were all led to believe with Joseph Smith was this general idea of an apostasy that that Christ set up his church on the earth and that the church fell almost immediately into apostasy. And so, you know, God's church wasn't on the earth for a couple millennia, and he needed, uh, you know, Joseph Smith to kind of bring back his one true church. And you even mentioned the the idea of a true and living church. Right. And I think this is where it begins for people, you know, to get really hung up. It's like, really? There's billions of people on the planet, and there's thousands of Christian churches, not, not to mention all the other non-Christian denominations, but there's only one true church, and it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with only like five or six million active members. And Joseph Smith had to be called as God's one true prophet, and only the Mormon prophet, like, is God's spokesman on the earth. Like, here's where it starts to get really problematic. Okay. But it begins with this teaching of the apostasy. How much of that do you sort of like say, I I, I acknowledge is a problem, or I disagree with, or I, I agree with? Maybe let's start there. With How do you see the apostasy and the restoration? How do you frame it? And Joseph Smith's role in it. Okay. Well, um, well, when you talk about one true church, you have to define what that means. Because I think some people look at that, and I think maybe even a majority of people look at that and say, well, this is the one true church, and so everybody else outside of this church is lost. Or inadequate. Or, ina- or not true. Or no authority, right? Well. <sighs> Illegitimate. So I'll just say, like, a, a, according to Orthodox Mormonism, a, a non-Mormon baptism doesn't count in heaven in terms of getting people in. And a non-Mormon Christian marriage doesn't, doesn't the, the ceiling doesn't persist. And that's not to get off on those rabbit trails. It's just to say those churches aren't true in, in the sense of like, I could have a fake driver's license or a real one. Right. A real one's issued by the state but a fake one doesn't count. It's not legitimate. And in Orthodox Mormonism, non-Mormon baptisms, non-Mormon marriages, non-Mormon churches are illegitimate in, in the same way that a fraudulent driver's license would not be viewed as legitimate by the state. Right. And I think that's accurate. The, the, and that would be really brutal and awful if we don't, we, if we don't go down. So the you're saying trails. you do believe that you do believe those things. Uh, 
I do believe them in the context of making sure that we recognize that we are providing those things, the, the real driver's license, the real baptism for every person who has ever lived. Because if you stop without understanding the universalist implications of the temple, then you have a real problem with the idea that only the 5.6 million people you've talked about are the people who are going to get into heaven. Uh, I do not believe that. Oh, and, and yeah, and the church doesn't either. And the church doesn't either. Yeah. But, but the thing is, when, when we talk about the one true church, uh, we don't ever talk about the fact that we believe that every human being that has ever lived will have the same chance to accept the authority of that one true church at some point in their eternal existence. So I don't see that as problematic in the same way that a lot of others do because I I, I think it's essential that we take the long view. The only problem is, and I, I, I believe that, that Mormonism has a very powerful universal universalistic strain. Right. And it is... It, 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 it's something that we don't want to admit publicly. It's something that we don't want to emphasize or right. acknowledge. It's like we talked about but, grace in the last section. But it is Feels true permissive. that we're saying your marriage doesn't count in heaven. Your baptism doesn't count in heaven. Your church is not legitimate. And that's also true. That is true. And yes, there's a way for everyone to get back to heaven. No, but, but it's not just there's a way. It's that your marriage... We will provide you with the kind of legitimate marriage, right? But but the, but, but, but uh, there's a, there is a there is an arrogant kind of insulting part of that for, for some that's saying we're superior um, and that you're not legitimate. That that's that part you can't. Re- I mean, if you're being honest, you can't shy away from that. I can understand why people would take it that way. Uh, at the same time, I think, and I can understand why members of the church would frame it that way. Uh, I am less and less comfortable framing it that way. Uh, I, I, because I don't see anything exclusionary in the core doctrines of what the church actually teaches. I see in terms of heaven, in well, terms it, of the it, afterlife, in terms of I mean, I, I, what it leads to and what it leads to is our beliefs are better than yours. We're more happy than you. We're more righteous than you. We've got the truth. You don't. Okay. And you see this in testimony meetings. It's like, I feel so bad for all the people that don't have the gospel because when someone dies, they don't have the same beliefs and, and, and they don't have a living prophet to tell them what's true. And there is all sorts of arrogance that can flow out of the, the, the implications of we're true and, and you're not. That has nothing to do with the but afterlife. See, I don't. I wouldn't say to someone that we're true and you're not. But but I'm talking I mean, about Mormon culture, I guess. Right. You can well, see sure. that, right? Sure, of course. I can. I can see that in Mormon culture, and I, I've experienced that in Mormon culture. Yeah. Um, I, I, but for you, that's not. Well, part of your view, you're saying. Well, or again, what 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 do we mean when we say, when we say we are the only true church, and and as I said in the last in the last thing, I. We're misquoting the Lord when we say that, because the, the only t- place that we have, this is the only true anything, it's always described as the only true and living church. And I see that living authority and power as not uh, a mark of superiority uh, so much as an added responsibility. I've sometimes described to people that I believe everybody gets saved and it's the Mormons who do the paperwork. You know, we have a responsibility as the living church, as the authorized living authority to go out and make this world better and to prepare the world for the second coming. It does not mean that people who do not accept the gospel in this life or the people who do not have these opportunities forever, that your marriage, if you were not married in the temple because you were not a member of this church, you are not going to be with your spouse in the eternities. I believe that everybody is going to yes. be it, with their spouse and in the you've eternities. Made that, you made that point, but right. it does mean that the Mormon church is better than the Catholic church. It's better than the Lutheran church. It's better than the Muslim church. It's better than the Orthodox, you know, the Jewish religion, because they're all incomplete and don't have the authority. That's that, It's just but there, we're there, there's, a, there's a culture of superiority that it imbues, that it engenders. I think people accept it as a culture of superiority. I reject it personally. Okay. Uh, uh, also, the other thing about that is that, is that uh, and th- this came up in the CES letter a lot, when, when he talked about all the different churches. Uh, 
Very few people in the 21st century think of themselves as part of a sort of centralized hierarchical church. You know, to compare uh, our church to Judaism, for instance, which is wildly decentralized. There's no one center of Judaism, one prophet of Judaism. Islam is, is fragmented all over the place. Christianity, I mean, Catholicism uh, is close in terms of the kind of hierarchical structures that they have there. Uh, but uh, people don't experience, uh, I don't think they experience God in that way outside of our church. Uh, and they don't look for God in that way outside of our church. So I think the comparisons often fall short because, you know, Jana Reese, again, wrote a great article when she talked about people, you know, we go, out, we go around as missionaries uh, acting like everybody's asking which is the one true church. That's not even a question that people are asking anymore. It's a question that Joseph Smith asked 150 some odd years ago, 200 years ago. Uh, but it's not a question that's being asked today. People are, you know, why do I need a church? What does church do for me? And, and I think that's one of the, the, the challenges that we have as a church is that we are sending missionaries out with a message that a lot of people just don't see any relevance to. It's, yeah. it, it's that it's not, did the church, which church is true? It's, it's how do I find God? How do I connect to God? And I, th I think the church's value is that we offer ways to do that. Uh, in, you know, I, I find the Book of Mormon, that's, that's the strength of the Book of Mormon, is not so much I can sit here and talk about the apologetic sort of arguments over historicity and everything else, uh, but that's not why the Book of Mormon has value to me. The Book of Mormon has value to me because it connects me to God. And so we need to go out and say, here's a way for you to connect to God. And to say, okay, but... Uh, the, the whole issue of which is the one true church uh, can certainly be framed in a way that says we are the superior church, we are the best church, this, that, and the other. Uh, legitimate. But, We're but, the legitimate church. But, well, but that continues to fall flat with the, with a world that isn't looking right. for a one true church. Yeah. And, and I think the strength of our message does not come in that exclusivity. I think we need to tailor the message in a way that we are a church that gives you the power to connect personally, directly to God, and here's how you can do it. And I think that message is what will resonate, and I think we're moving closer to that message than we have. But, but uh, no, I, I recognize that people can hear this idea of the one true church and say, you know, who do you think you are? Why, you know, it's that old joke that St. Peter's walking new people through heaven and there's a building over there, shh, be quiet, they're the Mormons, they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> you know, I, and, and I think that, uh, that, that we, we do a disservice to our, to our doctrine, to our theology, when we focus on that kind of exclusivity. Because at its core, we say, we are going to save everybody. Yeah. If it takes a gazillion years for everybody to go through the temple and do it for every person that's ever lived, everybody is going to get saved. So, so I, I mean, I'm the, I, I, I love the, the humble premise of like, we're just the bureaucrats. We just do the paperwork. Right. I, I think, I think that's an elegant way to look at it instead of we're superior. We're like the bureaucrats that do all the paperwork. I do think that this is a legacy Joseph Smith gave us. I think this was like how he differentiated himself from everybody else eventually is by claiming the authority. This didn't come in until 35 or 38 right. or whatever. Right. So, I mean, this is a legacy that comes from section one of the Doctrine and Covenants. Right. And um, so it's, I'm sure that's tough to, gra tough to gra grapple with. When I became a progressive Mormon, the way I dealt with it was just to believe two things, that all this stuff about temple ordinances having to be performed for the dead, I'm just like, uh, somehow that, there's good that comes out of that, but there's more to it. And this idea that God can't get everyone to heaven without some dude going in the water right. on behalf of somebody else. There's like, maybe we've got that a little bit wrong, but but there's good that comes from it. But I lost faith at some point, even as a progressive Mormon, at this requirement that an ordinance be performed for everyone who's ever lived. And then, and I'm not sure if you have flexibility there, but I'm curious about that. But then the other thing I did is I just, I adopted this many, 
many paths up Mount Fuji thing, right. which is just like you can get to God from Catholicism, you can get to God from Judaism, you can get to God through Buddhism, you can even get to God through atheism, and we're just we're one of many paths, and we can help people, but people can get there without us. Those were just a couple ways that I made sense of things. No, and and I, I absolutely I, I have long thought, you know. The, the, the ordinances that we do, the rituals that we perform. Ordinance, incidentally, the way we use the word ordinance in the church is different from the way anybody else uses it. An ordinance outside of the church is a law. It's not a ritual. We're talking about rituals. And these rituals, uh, I think, are for the benefit of the membership more than they are necessarily for the benefit of the efficacy of what happens afterwards. I don't want to say they have no efficacy. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, the benefit that I see personally, particularly in the temple, is is the connection that it 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 makes us part of a greater human family, you know, turns the hearts of the children to the fathers, to use the scriptural phrase. But there is value in that, in seeing that kind of a connection over the generations. Uh, how much, how bureaucratic or legalistic the Lord is going to be, you know, what what's he going to do about the the sealing ceremony I was in, where the guy. The sealer decided that every Hispanic name needed to have Inzio added to it. You know, we had some guy named Rodriguez, and he said Rodriguez says Inzio, <laughs> and I, I ended up bursting out laughing across the altar, which was probably not appropriate. You know, but how much of that matters? How much of that legalism matters? Uh, to me, I can't imagine that it's much, if any. I, I, I think the value is we are being taught something by turning ourselves to our ancestors that way and connecting the human family that way. And we are being taught that the kind of exclusivity that you're talking about is not something that we should be trumpeting because that we are we are being taught, we are sealing the entire human family as one family. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know the legal ramifications of that beyond what I know it does to me to be able to more fully connect with the people who've gone before. Yeah, and I, and I love that. And I think this is a theme we'll come back to over and over again in our time together. We, when we kind of form our orthodox beliefs as Mormons, we have there's so much specificity, so much certainty, and so much confidence. It's like black and white, and this is what the afterlife is like, and this is what the ordinances do. It It's kind of like to become a progressive Mormon and stay in the church. There's a heavy dose of like, I'm not so sure anymore how, how that all works, but Heavenly Father's going to work it out, right? But, but and, there, there isn't anybody that's that 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 is sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About, but but, I mean, th th this is where I would push back: is that I don't think that makes you a progressive Mormon to say, "Gee, I don't know how the legal ramifications of this are going to function." All I know is that connecting myself to my ancestors this way is good for me and good for my family. I had someone define the other day, "true," meaning does it does it improve my life? And I, okay. I think you're resonating with that idea that something's true if it makes your life happier and healthier and better, right? That's a that's a sign yeah. of the truthfulness of something. Yeah, yeah. I I, th I think there's more to that though. I I mean I, I think that just because something makes you feel good, that doesn't necessarily make I it. I didn't true. say feel good. No, but I said improve your life. Improves your life. All right, I'll have to I'll have to yeah, I'm not asking you to commit to that. that. Okay, so Joseph Smith, so I'm not gonna be in with the first vision. Because I don't think that's where it all begins. I, I, I really don't. You think the first vision is sort of a retroactive? Not totally. Retcon. Not totally. Let me, let me, let me sort of, I've gone back and tried to study the history. And what I think it starts with is uh, folk magic. I think that, um, I, you know, the way I read the history is that Joseph Smith Sr. was not a successful farmer, their family became destitute. They were also, superstition was very prevalent at the time. And this this treasure digging stuff that, that kind of really emerges around 20, 20, you know, 20, 18, 20, 18, 23, Joseph gets involved with it. And he starts to garner the reputation as being someone who has special power, someone who can see um, things in the ground that other people can't see. Right. He can find treasure. Even though he's never really able to find treasure, his early superpower is to is for people to come off believing he has special powers when he actually never produces 
the result of having the special powers. In other words, he gets paid to take people on these silver mining expeditions, never finds treasure, but somehow people walk away still believing he has, or some walk away believing that he has that special power. And well, so that's where the seer stone, that, you know, that's where the seer stone comes in. That's where the hat comes in. And that's where Joseph's lore of having special powers comes in. And then once that jig was up, so to speak, by 1827, he's got to find a new a career because he's going to be thrown into jail if he keeps doing this over and over again. And so he pivots to the Book of Mormon and the church. And I'm not saying there's no divinity there. You can still believe all this and still believe there's divinity. But I'm just saying, for me, that all comes before the first vision. And so how do you see it? Well, and do you agree with any of that? Uh, in part, what parts do you agree with? Uh, I, I I think the the treasure seeking, particularly with Josiah Stoll, is pretty well documented. But to say that it was the sole focus of his life and everything that he did up to that point, uh, and that he was the, the the that I didn't say. Well, but the Book of Mormon is sort of a career change for him because the treasure seeking wasn't working out. Well, let me, let me make my case because okay. if you look at the story of the book of Mormon, right? Right. If you look at treasure digging, there's spirits that guard treasure underground. So there's treasure underground guarded by spirits, right? That Joseph used a hat and a stone to find with his special powers. That's treasure digging. And then you just look at the Moroni story. There's treasure buried in a hill guarded by an angel that Joseph uses his stone and his hat and special powers to find. Oh, I, I don't know and anything about jo Joseph talking about using the stone to find the Book of Mormon. I mean, he uses the stone to translate the Book of Mormon. No, no, no. All of the treasure digging was, the stone was, I don't know about the hat, but the stone was the way, he didn't have powers without the stone in those first 10 years. He, The stone was, he learned it from Sally Chase and then the stone was was how he found stuff. And people people were so excited about his special powers, and it was a stone. Anyway, the point is that structure right. of treasure buried underground that's guarded by a spirit that Joseph finds using his special powers, which I'm going to say involved the stone. Can't you see a parallel in structure between that and the, the fundamental Book of Mormon narrative? Um. I can to some degree. I think that I think that what's remarkable is that if 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 indeed the Book of Mormon is just sort of this naturalistic extension of Joseph Smith's treasure digging prior to 1827, uh, then Moroni doesn't make any sense. Then the whole Christianity of it doesn't make any sense. Well, no, he also so, believed in Jesus. He also well, believed well, in the Bible. Yeah, but but but. He but, believed in the Bible, for sure, and I, Jesus. I, I, I think when you start to paint Joseph Smith prior to 1827, um, you can paint him any way you want to some degree because his life isn't documented nearly as well as people contend that it is. I mean, all we really know about his treasure digging comes from his experience with Josiah Stoll, which later in his life, Joseph Smith completely dismissed and said, oh, this guy wanted to go find a silver mine and we told him to stop digging after a few months and so much for my reputation as a money digger. And uh, I think Joseph was probably playing down the fact that he was more involved in this than, than, uh, than he wanted to admit later in his life because he recognized that it, it appeared disreputable. And, the, and we have uh, fairly recently discovered the court proceedings of Joseph being tried as a disreputable person, and it's Josiah Stoll who rescues him, who comes in and says, "No, no, no, Joseph was great, and I, I, I'm happy with what he did for me, and and it was all dismissed." Uh, but, but so so to, I, I'm not willing to say I, I would frame it personally uh, to say that whatever Joseph's experience with folk magic was, um, it. It would likely made him more susceptible to the kind to be open to the kind of revelation that he later claimed to have with regard to the Book of Mormon. Uh, but I don't think the Book of Mormon, particularly the product of the Book of Mormon, is reflective of the kind of treasure digging obsession uh, that I 
I, and I'm, I guess I'm still putting words in your mouth, but, but I, I should amend what I said because I think it's, it's, there's equal parts. I, I, I'm going to amend what I said. There's equal parts, sincere belief in God, sincere belief in Jesus, and a love bordering on obsession with the Bible, okay. right? And the the stuff I said before. And believe so, so like treasure digging. Munge those two together sure. in equal parts. Sure. But but I, I think I, I, I don't it's always interesting to me when pe people look at things and they say, well, Joseph Smith just got this revelation because he needed it at the, you know. I was taught in primary, for instance, that the reason why the word of wisdom exists is because Emma was tired of scrubbing out tobacco stains on the floor of the school of the prophets. And I remember as a kid thinking, well, that's convenient. You know, what? It's a revelation. And and my primary teacher saying, yeah, that's how revelation works. You get an answer when you ask a question. And so I, I, I don't have any problem with the idea that Joseph Smith's experience with folk magic and treasure digging sort of prepared him for the idea of a Barry Golden record. Uh, it, you know, you can look at that and say, oh, well, that's clearly just a product of this. Whereas I take it from the other end right, and say, right. that prepared him right. and Bushman, for the that's possibility. A, that's kind of, of Bushman's this. position, too. Okay, I well, think. if I'm standing with Bushman, I think I'm, <laughs> I'm on solid ground. But, but I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with the fact that Joseph Smith was superstitious and a treasure digger. I, I don't have a problem with that. But, but when. What do you make? And, and by the way, I I I love. I think this is an elegant approach. I'm not uh, challenging you or, or or criticizing you for it. But I I do want to ask one thing, like when Joseph takes someone to a precipice and says, "Here it is. Here's the treasure. It's right here, everybody." And then they dig and they dig and they dig, and then at the last minute, he's like, "Oh." You didn't do that thing right. God took the treasure away, or the spirit took the treasure away. It's gone. Like, there, there's kind of three options. One is he's fooling people. One, uh, in lying, I guess there's two options. One is that he's lying and fooling people. Or two is that he really believes that there's treasure there and that an angel is taking it away. Um. And then I guess within that, there's there actually is treasure and an angel guarding it, and that is being taken away, or he was wrong, right? But I mean, that I think, like, it's hard to believe that he, it doesn't it challenge his credibility if he really believed there were spirits withdrawing treasure? And do you allow for the possibility that he was just trying to make a scratch out a living and that he was deceiving people? And if so, knowing that it was illegal, knowing that what he was doing was illegal, and he was actually put in, like, convicted of engaging in, in he, illegal he, behavior, he, he didn't. I mean, he he was doing illegal behavior, and he was he was as assessed at some point by a judge for engaging in illegal behavior. Do, do, is there any is there any room for him being deceptive in that process for you? Or is that just beyond Joseph's possibility to be deceiving people? No, I don't think it's beyond anybody's possibility to deceive anybody. I mean, I, I think that Joseph is intentionally. A, well, I, I, I have to look at the records that you're talking about because because the only, the only court proceeding where he was accused of anything illegal was a hearing that was dismissed without any charges being brought, where Josiah Stoll came in and 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 saved his bacon. And the idea that we have a whole bunch of records of Joseph leading people to precipices and saying, the angel's taken the treasure away, uh, I'd have to, I, I, I'm not familiar with specific records that describe that in detail. Are there specific records that describe that in detail? I mean, before, before he was working, the, the reason why he went to Josiah Stoll, the reason why Josiah Stoll reached out to him- Is he had a reputation. Is because he had a reputation. Right. And he learned it from Sally Chase- who was, you know, a, a nearby neighbor. She had a stone. Yeah, he, he saw he, her he doing the well, it. He dug the well and, and found he found, the stone. he got his own stone yep. because he, you know, like the people surround, it's like, oh, Sally has a stone. And then he's like, oh, well, I need a stone. And then he gets a stone 
And then he starts doing it around his neighborhood. Then he gets the reputation and then he goes to Pennsylvania. So yeah, I think, well, and then, then there's also plenty of, plenty of accounts of people in Palmyra saying that's what Joseph well, right, Smith Sr. The, and Jr. were known for. Yeah, but the, the, how else did Josiah Stoll hear about Joseph Smith? Right, right. But the, the, the Palmyra accounts come from the Hurlbut aff affidavits way after the fact. And Not uh, way after, a couple uh, years after. No, five years about, after. Five about, years after. Ten, ten, ten years after. They, they they talk about how notorious Joseph Smith was for unspeakable acts, and then they never talk about what the unspeakable acts are. Well, uh, I mean, I, I I don't view those affidavits particularly charitably. Well, historians now will like credible, faithful Mormon historians now. I hear them saying, "Yes, there's problems with the Herbert affidavits." But there's a lot of valid stuff in there too. And we've been too quick as apologists to dismiss them summarily. Yeah. That there's that there's maybe 50-50, right? But certainly not 90-10. There, there's, there's, there's fire where there's smoke, you know? But, but the thing is there's smoke without specificity in the Hurlbut affidavits. That too, that too. That's the, one of the problems with the Hurlbut affidavits is not that they're unreliable and all these people are lying. It's that they just tell us Joseph Smith was the worst of worst people. He was terrible. He was awful. He was the worst. Okay, what did he do? Give me an account of something that you saw him do that was bad. And and they, they, they don't have any of that. I mean, you, you have, um, what's the dude's name? Because Jeremy talks about him in the CES letter. Who He's the guy who accuses Joseph Smith of stealing everything from Captain Kidd. Uh, but he talks about this huge cave that Joseph Smith had where he was translating the Book of Mormon outside a cave with all these guards, but nobody was able to go in there and nobody really cared because it was really boring and uninteresting. And I look at that and I go, this, this doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't know how to make sense of a lot of this historical record because the, the specific accusations against Joseph Smith rely on a whole lot of hindsight and not a lot of first-person accounts of what was happening at the time in the 1820s. Now, regardless, I, I, I'm not That's fine. To, That's fine. I don't want to skirt your issue because, because the, 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 uh, to get to the point, is it possible Joseph Smith could have deceived people? Yes. Intentionally? Yes. Like when he when in with Josiah Stoll and the Silver Mine Expedition, yes, it is possible. he's saying, oh, oh sorry, the, the spirit took away the treasure. Either he believes that or he's lying. It's got to be one or the I, other, right? I, well, and we don't want to call Joseph a liar. No, right? I'm not calling Joseph a liar because I don't know the specific. The thing is, you have to give me a specific. Did he lie on this occasion? I, 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 Joseph talks about when he recounts when he, the when first he told vision. them, I see a treasure, start digging. And then he says, Oh, the angel, the, the spirit took the treasure away. That is pretty much well, indisputable. But we, no, but, but we don't have him documented saying that. We don't. We, we, We've just got a bunch of witnesses, including his father-in-law. No, we have witnesses that, that he, he was did. involved in treasure digging. But the idea that he was lying about this, that, and the other in a specific—I I mean, no. The, we, we, the fact that he led people to a spot, said dig here, and that after they dug a while, he said the spirit withdrew the treasure. I don't know any credible historian that that does not acknowledge that that happened. Well, then that's fine. I, I'm. I'm. So. So given that. Given that my I mean, my my personal uh, feeling is that I, the the more I examine the life of Joseph Smith, um, the more I believe that Joseph Smith believed in Joseph Smith. Um, you know, you look at the Book of Abraham, for instance. And there's no question that Joseph Smith believed that ancient funerary texts that had nothing to do with the Book of Abraham were written by the hand of Abraham. And he said so. Uh, was he lying? I don't think he was lying. I think he believed that. So my 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 um, interpretation of that kind of an event would be that Joseph Smith had full confidence in himself and in his ability, and believed that the spirit must have moved it because if it wasn't there, then what other explanation could there be? Because obviously I have this gift and all that kind of thing. So uh, you know. I I don't believe that the life of Joseph Smith demonstrates a propensity for deliberate deception. So I can't speak. Is it possible that Joseph Smith was deceiving people? Uh, yes, of course it's possible. 
I don't think it's likely, based on my understanding of Joseph's later life, uh, is it possible that he was deceiving people uh, when he was young and that he grew out of it and they got better at it? Or, you know, I, I, I get, this, this all goes into reading Joseph Smith's mind and judging his motives. When, when, he, when, he, when he hides or denies polygamy from Emma or right. from other people, and we'll come to polygamy we'll later, to polygamy. but like, but it's like, problematic on, uh, for a is number that of reasons. deception? Uh, yes. So he can deceive people. Uh, of course, but but knowingly who, and intentionally deceive. Of course, people. but okay. who can't is my point. Okay. My, my my point is 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 that if if you're framing this as saying okay, anybody who has ever intentionally deceived anybody is disqualified from serving as a prophet. Okay. Okay. No, I'm not saying that. No. But, but so you so I I hear you settling on he can. In your mind, Joseph Smith, it is possible that with the with the silver digging and with polygamy, he intentionally, knowingly deceived people. How could it he not? He could have. Well, how could it and, not be possible? And he I'm can not, still be a prophet. Well, but but see, this is, the, the way that's even framed to me is just kind of bizarre. Because do we believe that there is anybody that is not capable of intentionally deceiving people? Have you ever in your life intentionally deceived anybody? I have. I have too. Yeah. Uh, I don't know anybody who hasn't. Right. That's part of the mortal experience. Right. Now, is there some kind of deception that Joseph Smith could have engaged in that would have been disqualifying beyond anything that a prophet should be able to do? I mean, that that's kind of a theoretical discussion. But 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 I I, I don't want to begin talking about Joseph Smith by trying to pretend that he. I don't believe, and maybe this is heretical. But I don't believe of anybody who's ever served in the highest offices of this church that any of them are necessarily better people than I am. Uh, that's not that I am the greatest person that's ever lived. It's that they are people. I think, you know, they are good people. I know a lot of good people. I, I remember being in a gospel doctrine class, and um, we were talking about the priesthood ban, actually, and and somebody said, well, the thing you have to understand is that these men are operating on a spiritual plane so far beyond <laughs> what we can even barely understand. And I raised my hand and I said, I believe there are 15 big men and women in this room who are righteous enough and spiritually in tune enough to serve in the highest offices of this church. Yeah. There's no question in my mind. Yeah. It's not about that these are better people than we are. It's that they are people who are called to a certain responsibility. And we have, and we to pick someone and, and, you know, they well, have talents, well, and, they and, have talents. And, and one of the wonderful things about this church is stake presidents are released and then they become nursery leaders the next Sunday, you know, with the exception of people who are called to lifetime callings, all of us serve in all these different capacities. So, so as you sit here and ask me, is it possible that Joseph Smith lied on occasion? Yeah, of course, of course it's possible Joseph Smith lied on occasion and Joseph Smith being part of the mortal experience lied on occasion. Okay. Uh, I don't think him lying about treasure digging when he was in, when he was a teenager uh, disqualifies him to holding high and holy office. Yeah. And I appreciate your candor. This is great. And I, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you or even beat you right. up or claim like I scored a point. No, I just appreciate the candor and I appreciate that you're providing a faithful perspective because I think people are going to value that. Well, I hope so, yeah. I, but 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 I think that's important because I think it's important that people so many so many problems with the church go away once you can say, well, yeah, he made a mistake. Oh, yeah. he really screwed that up, yeah, big time. Okay, so the the place where and this is the reason why I the reason why I brought this up is because it gets complicated in my view, when he pivots from the treasure digging to the Book of Mormon, right. only because, okay, there's there's one possibility, and I'm going to be covering old ground that we just covered, but let's just say with the treasure digging, there's two options. One is that he really believed there was a spirit withdrawing a, a treasure, you know, that it was in the ground. That's hard to believe, but it's possible. And then the other option that you just acknowledged is that he was knowingly intentionally deceiving people. And, and you get that because there are points where he like apologizes to Isaac Hale, according to Isaac Hale, where he cries and he says, I'm so sorry I did this. I was, you know, I was deceiving people, according to Isaac Hale. I was engaging in dishonorable behavior. 
and I've cleaned that up and I'm going to stop. And that gives you the impression that Joseph believed he was doing something unsavory. That That's my interpretation. If you read Isaac Hale, Emma's father's yeah, affidavit, yeah. he really, he, that's what he says, Joseph said, weeping, something to that effect. And to me, that combined with the fact that we know he lied to Emma and the church membership later about polygamy, I'm just agreeing with you that there's a decent probability that he was lying about treasure digging. And the reason, you don't have to agree with that, but that's how I see it. And so the reason why it becomes problematic for the Book of Mormon is twofold, is because number one, we there are so many problems with the Book of Mormon as being seen as a credible historical document, from the DNA to the problems of geography to the all the anachronisms and to to just it 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 representing you know, 19th century Western America and Joseph's worldview, resolving all the Protestant disputes at the time, not to mention having Christianity before Jesus was even born in America. Like there's so many egregiously problematic, fraught problems with the Book of Mormon as a historical document that when you combine that with the fact that he basically used the same instruments of fraud that he used in the treasure... Some people will say instruments of fraud that he used with treasure digging. He just took that very same peepstone and didn't even really look at the plates when he produced the document. That, in some people's mind, that taints the Book of All those things together taints the Book of Mormon as the document we were told it was. Now, I know you're going to go immediately, or I imagine you're going to immediately go to but it, does it make you a better person? Do I feel good when I read? Do I feel good when I read it? Does it make me want to be a better person? Does it make me believe in Christ? And I'm going to say that's all separate from the problematic nature of of its historical credibility and the fact that it arises from the same instruments of likely fraud that that Joseph used in the treasure digging. Now that's a lot, but now <laughs> it is a lot. But can, can you just and that that wasn't where I was going to go because I actually I actually think the case for a historical book of Mormon is much stronger than the critics are willing to allow. And I think we'll get there. Uh because I don't want I I, I want yeah, we can go there next. But well, like, well, I want to start where you started because you started by saying, well, okay, so either he believed in his own folk magic ability, which is unlikely. And I don't understand why that's unlikely. Why, do, do, you, do, you, do you think that Joseph Smith um, believed in his own prophetic calling, or do you think that he was knowingly perpetrating a fraud from the beginning? It's impossible to know people's motives, but people like, you know, who, who can you respect more than Dan Vogel? And even Dan Vogel admits the pious part of the pious fraud, meaning that that, that Joseph and was I, a believer. And I think anybody that believes Joseph didn't believe in God at all or Jesus at all or the Bible at all, that's a real stretch. And I, I, have, I have engaged in, not on the same level as Joseph Smith, but I personally have engaged in egregious self-justification. I have done things <laughs> to hurt my wife, for example, yeah. and my kids, where at the time I felt justified. So why wouldn't, why wouldn't Joseph Smith be capable of believing that in a very sincere way that what he was doing had a divine uh uh had divine support. So right. yes, I, I think it's probably more likely than well, not that he believed he was doing God's will or even doing authentic things, you know? I <laughs> Because because I think that is the more likely explanation. Uh, yeah. That doesn't necessarily make him incapable of deception right. or any of that. Right. But but I, I think you take Joseph Smith's life, sum total of his life, and one of the reasons why so many people have been stymied by him is it, it seems very clear that he was a believer. He believed yeah. in himself. He believed in his calling. He believed in the Book of Mormon. He believed in the Restoration. Yeah. Uh, was he wrong? Yeah, well, that's certainly a possibility. But I think that is the more likely explanation, even from an early age, is that Joseph believed in all of this stuff. And Joseph believed in things where he was wrong. But uh, I think his sincerity is, uh, is relevant not because it makes something true that isn't otherwise true, but I think it it helps to explain further on as we see Joseph Smith's legacy and we see 
uh, the, the, the remarkable things that he was able to accomplish in such a short life, uh, I, I think it, it demonstrates that the fact that he believed that they were divinely motivated, uh, I think compels us to take it more seriously than we would otherwise. If they were convincing evidence of deliberate deception, uh, I don't think we would be even having this conversation because I think everything Joseph Smith did would have collapsed the same way everything James Strang did has collapsed. You know, when you have people who are per perpetrating deliberate deceptions, they don't stand the test of time the way that the Book of Mormon has stood the test of time, the way that even though the church is vastly different from the church Joseph Smith established in 1830, uh, his legacy has survived and if there were clear evidence of deliberate deception, I just don't think that would be the case. So what, what then, with that logic, what do you make of the Islam or what do you make of Catholicism or, you know, these other strains right. that were led by charismatic leaders that claimed, um, you know, visitations from God, that claimed some divine mandate, but whose founding narratives are not supported by the, the LDS church kind of gospel, you know? Well, I, you, you actually look at the statements and those are the church Islam's issued. bigger. Islam's bigger than Mormonism. Yes, much bigger. Catholicism is bigger than Mormonism. Yes. So huge, massive things can come from things that right. Mormonism, or even Scientology, is super rich and influential. Yeah, but— Super rich and influential and sustaining organizations can come from— non-authentic or non-true foundations. Oh, that's true. I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that that, that that closes the door on the possibility. I'm saying it, it makes it more like, I mean, you look at Islam. I, I think that Muhammad was absolutely a believer. Uh, and uh, Okay, he I was mean, a believer in his stuff. In his stuff. Yeah. I, I don't think, yeah. that, I mean, yeah. it seems unlikely to me that he thought he was perfect. If, if he didn't believe him. in what he was teaching, it would have had a harder time growing. Or right. And I think even in the case of Scientology, you can read stories of L. Ron Hubbard trying to rid himself of his own body thetans with his auditing machines. That's interesting. I mean, he believed in his own stuff too. Um, you know. Okay, I, I see. I see. I'm, I, so, I, okay. so, 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 but, but, so, so, it doesn't slam the door on the fact that Joseph Smith was a fraud. What it does is, I think, makes it more likely that he was a believer rather than he was a deliberate okay. deceiver. Got it. Got it. So, so with the Book of Mormon, then, um, I, I I went through kind of all the many 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 problems I see with the Book of Mormon being a historical document. It just, I think we've been set up because the way it's been framed is a farm yokel could never have come up with such a brilliant book, and so it must be true. You know what I mean? But the truth is, Joseph was super brilliant by anyone's estimation. Maybe he wasn't didn't have good grammar, didn't have good spelling, didn't have good handwriting, but we all know he was brilliant. We've all seen the original manuscripts of the Book of Mormon, which is fraught with spelling and punctuation and grammatical errors that were only improved and fixed by editors. Right. A lot of hard work. Well, there was no punctuation in the first draft. E.B. Grandin yeah. is the one who punctuated Yeah, so I mean, Joseph's a lot better than we've been sometimes sold to believe the Book of Mormon was a, in its first draft was a lot less polished than it is now, um, and, and uh, you know, and it is if once you understand the the mound builders myth, once you understand the 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 legends, the folklore legends about Native Americans that gives rise to the view of the Hebrews, that gives rise to the Book of Napoleon, that gets gives rise to. The, the Bible, right? And Jeremy talks about all this stuff. Right. If you, if you understand the Bible, if you understand Protestant Christianity, if you understand the m masonry in the 1800s, if you understand, um, you know, Joseph Smith and, and the, the Mound Builders lore, it's, it's not so much that the Book of Mormon is this mir miracle that you can never explain. It's almost like the Book of Mormon is exactly the book that you would expect to be produced in the 1800s, including horses and pigs and wheat and, you know, all the things that shouldn't be there and all the Protestant debates of Joseph Smith's time. They're all baked in. Like, it's exactly the book that you would expect uh, someone like Joseph Smith to produce. Now, I, I know that that's heresy, but I really believe an objective look at 
if you understand the 1820s and the, the cultural milieu that Joseph is swimming in, the Book of Mormon is a product of that time. It doesn't have chocolate. It doesn't have jaguars. It doesn't have turkeys. It doesn't have all the things that we know. Native, and that's what Michael Coe, my interview with Michael Coe. Yeah. All that stuff is what should have been in the Book of Mormon, and it wasn't, right? And so yeah, do, you, do you concede any of that, the 19th century nature of the Book of Mormon? Um, How much of the 19th century uh, you know, influence do you allow in the Book of Mormon? And how do you make sense of all that? Uh, I'm trying to find the right way to approach this because I don't concede a whole lot of that. Uh, because I, if, if you read Bushman, for instance, if you read Rough Stone Rolling, he talks about the fact that the Book of Mormon actually uh, is not the kind of Native American explanation that you would have expected to be produced. There was a book called the Book of Pukey or Pukai. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I've only read it. It was a parody of the Book of Mormon that has wigwams and teepees and, you know, and the Book of Mormon doesn't have any of that. The Book of Mormon doesn't have the kind of Native American stereotypes that you would have expected in terms of an explanation for the Indians, which is how Joseph Smith sold it. You read it and Bushman says, but you get ancient American Christianity on every page. It refuses to argue its own thesis. Uh, so I, I would push back very strongly on the idea that the Book of Mormon represents exactly what you would imagine or expect to find in somebody's speculation about the Native Americans from the 19th century. What about a lot? Not exactly, but what about no, a no, lot? No, no, no. I, I, I don't think, I think if you were to get anybody else in the 19th century to write a history of the Indians who had populated the, the, the continent, uh, it wouldn't look anything like the Book of Mormon. Okay, so what about the light skin, dark skin thing? Because right. I, I've read a book on the Mound Builder myth. Right. That that precedes Joseph Smith by a couple hundred years, and right. pretty much everyone around Joseph Smith at the time who was into this stuff believed that these amazing relics that we were finding couldn't have been created by these savage, dark people that were all committing have, genocide upon. Right. So there must have been a light-skinned race that preceded them that they killed off, and they must have created. So that founding Nephite, Lamanite, light-skinned, dark-skinned thing, in my reading, is a super racist cultural uh, justification for genocide that existed during Thomas Jefferson's era, right, and and was is the core narrative of the Book of Mormon. Well, I don't think racism is the core narrative. No, the, of the Nephite Book of and the Lamanite. Well, no, the Nephite and Lamanite. What's remarkable about the Book of Mormon, with regard to race, particularly and the Nephites and the Lamanites, is that the lessons that we have extracted from it, uh, the text itself argues very differently. For, you know, who's the most righteous prophet in the Book of Mormon is but, a dark-skinned prophet, Samuel that's, the Lamanite. That's skirting the issue that it starts out with the bad people getting given dark skin as a curse. Uh, like, don't jump to, you can't, people, apologists do this. They jump to Samuel the Lamanite and say, look, oh, at the end of the Book of Mormon, there are a few Lamanites that are good. But that, no, it's that, not just that, a few. That, by the end of the Book of Mormon, Lamanite is no longer a racial designation. By the end of the Book of Mormon, people... But don't jump to that. I'm saying address no, the, no, the, the I'm, I'm structural. Well, the, the reason structural I'm jumping to that is because, is because uh, the narrative that the Book of Mormon is a simplistic white supremacist document. I'm not making that argument. I'm okay. I'm arguing that it's a night. It's a that it's obvious a 19th, century. 19th century structure that gets absorbed. It's it's in Joseph's milieu. It's in the view of the Hebrews. It's Thomas Jefferson knew it. Benjamin Franklin knew it. Everyone who was studying this stuff knew it. And it's like adopted into the Book of Mormon. Well, For, forget the good things it says about dark people right, later. Right. Well, well, it's, it's, I, the, it's the 19th century thing that I want you to explain. Well, the, well that's racist. <laughs> and there's no historical evidence for ever there being light skinned Native Americans. Right. Right? Well, right. Well, I mean, there's no and the question. DNA doesn't justify that, well, right? Well, the, the DNA, we, we can get to DNA too. I, mean, I, I want to back up a little bit and take a more 30,000 view approach to this because this actually preoccupied my father in the last years of his life. Um, uh, on, the, on the 10th of April, 2016, my father, who was suffering from pancreatic cancer at the time, 
uh, gave a fireside. Uh, I, I've written an article about this for the Interpreter Foundation, and I and I transcribed my father's fireside on my blog, and titled it "Somebody Wrote It." And he says uh, uh, he gave this fireside. The next day, he, he suffered a stroke, and he was dead three weeks mm. later. And so this was kind of his final message, and it has this sort of fraught implications to me, to me, but his book that he wrote also was focused on this, is he says, all right, uh, the Book of Mormon exists. That means somebody wrote it. You have to explain who wrote it. It can't be waved away. And, and it's, it's not enough to say, to point out the anachronisms and say, God didn't write it. You have to come up with an alternative explanation. This is how Joseph wrote it. And the alternative explanations, including from Dan Vogel and from a number of other people who try to say this is how the Book of Mormon was produced, um, none of them are persuasive to me. And, and the, the multiplicity of them weakens the argument for each one of them individually. I mean, one of my biggest problems with the CES letter is that you have Jeremy Runnels comes in and says, well, the Book of Mormon was plagiarized from the view of the Hebrews. Well, the Book of Mormon was plagiarized from the first book of Napoleon. Oh, the Book of Mormon was plagiarized from the late war of 1812. Oh, no, the Book of Mormon was lifted from all of these place names and all of these areas outside of Joseph Smith's homeland. And no, the Book of Mormon, he stole Captain Kidd and Moroni from, you know, all, all the, and, and you, you come up with this process where Joseph Smith is sifting through all of these source materials and picking a three-word phrase here and a two-word phrase there and, and, and putting it all together. I mean, the view of the Hebrews, whenever anybody brings up the view of the Hebrews, because uh, the, the Godmakers brought up the view of the Hebrews when I was 18 years old, and I had no access to the view of the Hebrews, and I was really shaken. And I imagine that the, book of, the view of the Hebrews you know, looked exactly like the Book of Mormon, and I thought like an idiot and a chump. Um, I read the view of the Hebrews all the way through. It's not very long. It's, four, it's 40,000 words. And I read it when I was responding to the CES letter. The view of the Hebrews bears no resemblance to the Book of Mormon at all <laughs> beyond the idea that, that Native Americans were Israelites. And, I mean, the, none of the arguments for the fact that the view of the, for the Native Americans are Israelites are in the Book of Mormon. And the view of the Hebrews structurally is such a different book. It's an essay. It's not a narrative. There's no story. There's no characters. There's no people in it. There's no Nephi or any of that kind of stuff. You know, so, I mean, so I look at that and I, so you back up and you say, okay, the other thing that's so but, miraculous. Wait, if, if there's no resemblance, why did B.H. Roberts come up with a list of like 150 parallels well, between... I, the he Book didn't of Mormon come, well, he didn't and come the, view of the Hebrews. Jeremy lists all the parallels in the CES letter, and uh, I'm just saying, B.H. Roberts, your guy, well, right? I don't, saw sure hunters, thought it was a big problem. B.H. Roberts, if you read that, I I, I, I really, you can debate what, where B.H. Roberts was with his own personal faith, because the way I look at it is that he produced this. And he talks about it as being a sort of devil's advocate brief and in saying these are the best arguments they're going to come after us with. It. And he even says these do not represent any conclusions of mine. This is, this is what I think our critics are going to say. Uh, the parallels, at least the ones that are listed in the CES letter, I have not gone and seen any other parallels that B.H. Roberts may have produced elsewhere. But there are something like 40. Uh, and they include things like uh, references to yellow – parchment that could be like references to gold plates. And, you know, the view of the Hebrews talks about a scrap of, of paper yellowed with age that had a, a verse of Deuteronomy on it, but the Native Americans had forgotten how to read, so they discarded it. But this is, you know, and there's nothing, and that, that doesn't bear any resemblance to the Book of Mormon. I, I, the, the parallels, I mean, you can go through my reply, but I, 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 one of the things that I was very frustrated with is I said, I said, uh, you made me read View of the Hebrews. Nobody should have to read View of the Hebrews. <laughs> it's not a great read. It's not a great read. But it's clear to me very often that the people who bring up View of the Hebrews as a source for the Book of Mormon likely have not read View of the Hebrews either. I, I'd be willing to bet money Jeremy Runnels has not read View of the Hebrews. Uh, I mean, I'm. It, 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 it's all of these arguments and, and the idea that, that, that Joseph Smith piecemealed the Book of Mormon into what it, what the Book of Mormon is now, uh, it, it demonstrates the weakness of each individual argument. And when I was getting my MBA at BYU, I was taught how to 
calculate the net present value of an asset. And my professor says, there are five ways to do that. You know what that means, don't you? I said, no. And he says, it means that none of them are any good. He says, because if there were one reliable way to calculate the net present value of an asset, you wouldn't need four other ways. You'd, you'd have some very specific kind of, this is how you do it, and the end of story. If there were one clear explanation for the Book of Mormon's existence, we would have it and, the, and, the, and it would be over. But the fact is, we keep looking for other, other, other explanations because the ones we have aren't adequate. Now, that doesn't mean that Joseph Smith's explanation of divine intervention and all that kind of thing is the true one. But it does mean to me that Joseph Smith's explanation is one that we need to take seriously because I haven't seen uh, an explanation. The, the other thing that I find extraordinarily remarkable about the Book of Mormon, as somebody who has as personally having written a number of things of any length, uh, is that the whole thing was written in first draft. You sit there and you look at the transcript and Joseph – Bushman talks about it's written in piecemeal. Joseph's dictating it to, to Oliver, and it's written, and it's, and it's published essentially as a first draft. It's submitted to E.B. Grandin without punctuation. E.B. Grandin sits up and, and punctuates it, and it's later edited, but, but the edits are for terrible spelling and weird grammar and journey, a, a journeying is turned into journeying and that sort of thing, but uh, the the handful of edits that are significant that Jeremy raises, for instance, like the son of God versus, you know, God, the eternal father, um, you know, th those are few and far between. And the, the reality is the book of Mormon as it exists was written in first draft. I don't know of anybody on the face of the earth who has ever done that, who has written a, you know, 265,000 word manuscript without any significant edits. Uh, what that would suggest is he's reading it from somewhere else. So somebody else, my father's book, he talks about there are three explanations for where the Book of Mormon came from. One is that uh, is Joseph Smith's explanation. The second is that Joseph Smith wrote it. The third is that a third party wrote it and that Joseph Smith stole it from this third party. And he goes through each of those and says each has different problems. And they do. They all have very significant problems. Uh, but the reason why uh, I, I would come back to what you had said earlier, though, is, uh, is the Book of Mormon's value to me isn't necessarily because I have been convinced of its historicity by these kinds of arguments. Its value is in its power to connect people to God. Uh, and there are people who have the experience of reading the Book of Mormon and finding value in it. Uh, while still while not believing it to be a historical document. And I certainly believe there's room for people in the church who hold that view. And there are an increasing number of people in the church that hold that view. But uh, I see the Book of Mormon as a tangible miracle uh, that speaks to the truth of the Restoration. I, I, I do believe it is a historical document. But what that means, again, we have to— does that mean that Joseph Smith— as translator, had no influence on its content? Because that's nonsense. I think we would absolutely see any kind of translator. Uh, a translator's responsibility is to clothe words and language and words they understand. So the fact that the, jo the, the Book of Mormon is written in Joseph Smith's vocabulary makes perfect sense to me. But, but I don't, I mean, I don't understand the process by which that happened. So how do you make sense of, I'll just say a couple things, like okay. Joseph Smith Sr.'s dream about a tree and, you know, becoming Lehi's dream, or the, the, the dark skin, light skin narrative uh, of, of, of cursing the, the wheat, the, sea, the steel swords, the helmets, the shields, the chariots. Do, let's not get in the weeds of any specific one. But there's all sorts of things. You know, the the parts of Isaiah, the De, you know the Deutero Isaiah, Deutero Isaiah, the parts of Isaiah that were written after Lehi would have left Jerusalem, so they shouldn't be in there because they were written after Lehi left with the brass plates. So like there, you have to admit there's all sorts of things in the Book of Mormon that shouldn't be there, right? Uh, yes, yes. How do you how do you make sense of that? I do it the way my father did. Uh, my father, this is the most interesting part of his book, where he's not summarizing the Book of Mormon. He's talking about his experience at the Hughes organization. 
uh, when um, Clifford Irving, the novelist who wrote the autobiography of Howard Hughes, wrote his fake autobiography of Howard Hughes, he had uh, access to um, a document written by another Hughes guy and put everything, larded it up with things that people expected to be in this autobiography. And so it was initially seen as genuine because there are things, how could he possibly have known this? Uh, but there was also a whole bunch of stuff in there that, that he made up. And as time has gone on, the autobiography looks increasingly ridiculous. Uh, if you look at the, 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 what they called the Mormon will, so when Howard Hughes died, there was a will that showed up at church headquarters in downtown Salt Lake, and uh, it gave one-fourteenth of the Hughes estate to a service station owner named Melvin Dumar. They made a movie out of it called Melvin and Howard, for which Mary Steenburgen won the Best Supporting Actress Oscar. And, uh, and this will was considered by several to be genuine, but there were things in there that were in one place, they talk about the spruce goose, which was Howard Hughes's during world war II. He'd written up, he built a flying boat that only flew once. It was the largest aircraft ever built and was built entirely out of pine, not spruce. And the press called it the spruce goose and how Hughes hated that title, and yet that's the title that appears in the will. The will also names Noah Dietrich as Hughes's executor, which would make sense to somebody who didn't know Hughes personally, because they would expect that to be the case, because he'd been Hughes's right-hand man for years. and But they'd had a halt falling out right before Hughes died, and there's no way that he would be the executor. So, so Dad's point was, there would be more anachronisms as time goes on and the remarkable thing about the Book of Mormon is that there are anachronisms in the Book of Mormon, but there are fewer of them than there were when the book was first published. That the Book of Mormon is less ridiculous as an ancient record than it was when – the idea that people bury gold plates in stone boxes was considered absurd. And they find the Darius plates and that are buried in a box that look very much like the box Joseph Smith described – you know, the idea of Native Americans living in large cities and not being savages. They hadn't discovered the ancient Mayan ruins that are now prevalent and that we now recognize at the time that Joseph Smith. I mean, as you look at this, he said the, the ledger starts to shrink over time rather than expand. That's not the way forgeries are supposed to work. So uh, taken as a whole, there's no question that there are anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. Uh, what's remarkable is that there are fewer of them over time. And, and my reaction to them is that you look at the Book of Mormon and you, you say, look, you know, we look at, for instance, LIDAR technology has completely revolutionized our understanding of where you served your mission. They've done all kinds of LIDAR and, and they found these huge cities that they didn't think existed before. And, there is so much more to discover about ancient America that to definitively say that we have enough scientific evidence to say this couldn't possibly have happened and there's no way, uh, uh, I think is really kind of arrogant and silly. And there are so many remarkable parallels in the Book of Mormon to things that Joseph Smith very much could not have known about. Uh, but the, the problem is when you start going down that road and you start to argue about that is that is that you're tr you start to build your faith on something that no doesn't really matter to anybody, right? Even if you get if you got Dan Peterson in here to talk to you about Nahum, which I think is a remarkable parallel, the idea that they find a burial site that is exactly where Joseph Smith says it's going to be in the Book of Mormon. You know, we could sit and argue back and forth, but there isn't anybody whose whose faith rests on archaeological evidence, even if there's enough of it to persuade them that, you know, Greg Prince in the documentary filmed, filmed a, a segment and he says, whenever he talks to anybody about the Book of Mormon, he asks them three questions. He says, the first question is, did you read it all the way through? And usually they say no. Second question, uh, what do you remember about what you read? Well, there were a lot of wars. Third question, what was your experience like as you read the book? Well, let me tell you. And he says, and that's when things light up. And he says, something happens to people when they read that book that wasn't in that book. So 
I, that's one of the reasons why I have confidence. Uh, that experience does not necessarily mean, you know, that a warm, wonderful feeling that you have when you read the Book of Mormon that may be similar to the warm, wonderful feeling you had when you watched the Muppet movie is proof that this is a historical document. What that means is it's proof that, that this book has the power to connect you to God, to plug you in. And it's enough for me to take the arguments for historicity far more seriously than I would take otherwise. And it's, it, it's enough for me to have patience with the anachronisms that I do not yet understand that cannot be explained away. And I do not deny that there are anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. I find it remarkable that there are fewer anachronisms now than there were in 1830. If Joseph can, okay, so we have the account of Joseph, of, of whoever hired, one of Joseph's colleagues saying that Joseph would look into the stone, he would see writing, he would read it. Right. Then the writing would vanish. It's David Whitmer. And then it would reappear. That's David Whitmer. So, and then we have examples in the Book of Mormon of words like kurlam or kumam or what kumumam or whatever. Yeah. The the currency where where he's coming up with words that have no meaning in the English vernacular, the English language at the time. If you take those two things together, then you shouldn't have anachronisms because he couldn't he shouldn't be calling it steel if it wasn't steel. He shouldn't be calling it wheat if it wasn't wheat. God can give him a, a, an accurate name that that wouldn't be misleading. If it really is a taper, the words letters T-A-P-I-R will show up there, not horse, right? right? Right. And so how does David Whitmer's account of the words appearing in the stone added to that, the Kuralam and the Kumam, where he can clearly generate words that no one's heard of, how does that leave room for anachronisms? Um, I think, I, I think that premise is exactly backward because, you know, uh, I think that when a translator, uh, is doing anything, he's doing whatever he can to use language that his audience is going to recognize, uh, and I think that would even include God, I, because I don't think that saying, for instance, um, but he could have called a kurlam a giraffe or a well, we don't elephant. know what a kurlam was. I mean, the, the, what's clear on kurlams and kumams is that there doesn't seem to be any kind of an antecedent that we would understand. Uh, I mean, what was this creature? We don't know. Uh, maybe you know, or maybe Joseph wouldn't have known. You're and, saying there wasn't a creature similar enough. To where I, that that word those I, you know, I, I another animal could have been I, I, used. I can't uh, I can't begin to fathom what a cure law or cumon. So is. what did horse mean? If we know, horses, I don't know. Do I don't you think know. there were horses. I I don't know. I I don't particularly care. I mean that's that seems like a dodge, and it probably is. I I I don't. I think there was some creature that was close enough to a horse. I think it could have been a taper, but I think it could have been a horse. I don't care. I, I mean, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't disqualify the Book of Mormon for me. It doesn't make me say, oh, well, then throw this whole thing out. All the rest of this doesn't make any sense. The fact that there seems to be miraculous explanations for all this, you know, oh, oh, oh well, then, then the Book of Mormon must be nonsense. Right. right, right. I, I, I think there is the possibility that there were still horses on the American continent that we do not yet recognize. There's some, I mean, apologists have sort of tried to sift through that and find some, there's some sparse evidence that that may have been the case. Uh, it may have been a, something that functions similarly to a horse. I don't know if that's a taper. I don't know. I don't have any idea. Uh, you know, I, I do know, for instance, that when, when uh, you know, the British settled America and they look at and they look at um, what the Native Americans call maize. They labeled that corn when that isn't anything like seed corn that was used in Great Britain prior to that. Uh, people tend to apply words that are similar in, in structure. And I, 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 to me, that, that is getting bogged down in something that, okay. that isn't of any real interest okay. to me. So you, so how, is it essential for you that actual golden plates were delivered to Joseph Smith by Moroni? It, 
Like I know, I know or believing Mormons that say, well, maybe Joseph created brass plates, but, but, but somehow he still channeled like he did with the book of Abraham. Right. He still challenged, channeled actual events, but maybe he created tin plates because clearly if they were really gold, they would have been way heavier than, than Joseph Smith could have, you know, carried and ran with. Right. Right. So maybe he created tin plates so that people would believe that, that, that they were actual records, but he still in his mind believed he was channeling. You know, there, there are ways that people kind of do some gymnastics to not require that there's gold plates in your mind. Does there have to be actual golden plates delivered by an angel for the narrative to stand? I believe there were actual gold plates delivered by an angel. So when I say whether or not there have to be, I'm sort of dealing in a hypothetical because I'm beginning with the premise that I that I am a believer that there were actual physical gold plates. Is it a tiny bit suspicious to you that he had to cover them and not let anyone see them? Is that a little bit suspicious? Like if I were to perpetuate a fraud and I were to claim to have something miraculous and, and at the time, golden plates delivered by sure. an angel – written by Native Americans, talking about Jesus before Jesus was even born. That's Not a just pretty, at the time, still now. It's, it's, Somebody shows up with those. Um, that's impressive. So if I were to tell you I had that, but you can't see them, I have to cover them with a plate. I have to cover them with a sheet. And then when I actually do the translation, the plates aren't even in the room. Like, isn't that start? Then you add to that the peep stone and the treasure digging. And then you add to that what you're going to acknowledge later, which is that Joseph really wasn't translating a papyra with, you know, knowing Egyptian, right. that the actual papyra had nothing to do. And then you add to that the Kinderhook plates, like all, any and one thing you might, are, any, uh, any one thing you might be able to sort of dismiss when you add all of that together, can you see how people would go now, wait a minute, that's, that's too much. Well, of course. I, I mean, uh, Joseph could see that. I mean, Joseph said that. I mean, that that's the title of Fawn Brody's book. You know, I wouldn't, no man knows my history. I wouldn't have believed my history if I hadn't lived it. I mean, of course I can see people looking at that and going, oh yeah, that's absolutely ridiculous. So sure. Uh, but I still believe <laughs> there were gold plates. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, and I think, again, uh, the testimony of the witnesses of the gold plates are not nearly as easily dismissed as they often are dismissed. So the common narrative is that they were yokels. Like Martin Harris right. went on to believe James Strang. He went on to that 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 these guys were like superstitious dudes that believed weird things before and after Joseph Smith. Right. And Joseph Smith was just one in a series of a lot of weird superstitious beliefs. They were most of them were treasure diggers. Most of them believed in the superstition folk magic, magic stones, spirits guarding treasure in the ground. And, and it's especially in David Whitner and, and Martin Harris's cases and Joseph Smith senior and all the Whitmers. Like the argument is these were super, th these were not majestic Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, no. like statesmen. Like, these were yokels that were semi-literate who were superstitious and they believed weird things before and after and, and Joseph Smith and the Mormon stuff. And they lost their faith and, you know, they, they left the church at some point, all of them did. So like, are you sure they're super credible dudes? Right. Well, or is that our narrative that we've fitted after? No, well, I'm super credible. I mean, you're talking about them, you know, as Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson, I, uh, you know, I, we think they're better than those guys. Well, Mormons I, do. Uh, and again, maybe my, my experience is, is not analogous or, or is not consistent with everybody else's, but that, that's never been my impression of any of these guys. Um, but uh, the fact that all of them left the church to me is remarkably compelling because all of them had pers very persuasive incentive to throw Joseph Smith under the bus, particularly David Whitmer, uh, who never came back. Both Martin Harris and Oliver Cowdery came back. Uh, but uh, David Whitmer had every incentive to expose Joseph Smith as a fraud and went out of his way to his deathbed insisting that he had seen the gold plates and that, and that the Book of Mormon was true. Um, 
you know, it, it's remarkable to follow the experience of these men after they leave the church because Martin Harris, yeah, he kept joining all these different churches after he left, and they kept kicking him out because all he wanted to do was talk about the Book of Mormon. No, but he also believed that James Strang's production of scripture from angels and plates uh, were, were also, he did, No, were uh, also truthful. No, no, I mean, you've got the one quote in the CES letter uh, where he, uh, Jeremy quotes um, a debate that took place after Martin Harris was dead, where a guy long after the fact said that Martin Harris said that a shaker book was just as good as the Book of Mormon. I, I, I don't put a whole lot of weight into that. I, I, I think you have so many firsthand contemporaneous accounts of the witnesses saying they saw what they saw. And then you have long, a whole you know, handful of people who say, well, I heard Martin Harris say he only saw them with his spiritual eyes. And I heard, you know, all these guys, it, it, it uh, I, I think the weight of the, of the, of the witnesses testimony does not come from the fact that they have these amazing credentials, but it has, it comes from the fact that the, their witnesses were con consistent over a long period of time during periods of time when they had every incentive to um, to repudiate what they were saying, and they refused to do it. But are you saying Martin Harris didn't believe that James String produced scripture? I don't know the specifics on the Martin Harris, uh, uh, the specifics on the Strangite scripture. I mean, uh, but I'd have to go back and look at that specifically. I, I think it's possible, certainly, sure. I don't or, think or David Harris, Whitmer said there was no Melchizedek priesthood. Like David Whitmer yeah, himself David, says, Joseph is making up this Melchizedek priesthood thing. That was never a part of the early church. And we don't have a date for the Melchizedek priesthood. Right. Like there are all sorts of reasons to question that because there's no date for the Melchizedek priesthood. Right. And one of, you know, we want to have it where it's like all oh, the three witnesses. But then if, if, if David Whitmer says no Melchizedek priesthood, that was made up and added later. Well, we, we conveniently, can you see that we're doing a little bit of picking and choosing there? Yeah. Uh, well, except for, except for, I think it's David Whitmer that's doing the picking and choosing, which I think is really kind of telling because by the time David Whitmer is saying, no, Joseph Smith did, never restored the Melchizedek priesthood. And I never heard anything about Peter, James and John and this, that, and the other. David Whitmer is, is insisting that Joseph Smith is a fallen prophet and is doing everything he can to discredit Joseph Smith, particularly over the issue of polygamy, which David Whitmer was completely horrified by and is the reason why he never came back. Uh, so you have that kind of a situation. Uh, so why isn't David Whitmer doing the one thing that would expose Joseph Smith as a complete and total fraud and saying, yeah, yeah, Joseph Smith was completely a fallen prophet and he may, he's making this up, and all the, but he can't bring himself to repudiate the Book of Mormon. But, but, but... There's two things. One is, if if he was complicit in some sort of deception, then he would be condemning himself. But the other the other possibility is the one you afforded Joseph Smith, which is he genuinely believed that Joseph Smith produced the Book of Mormon through right. divine means, but that Joseph fell away. Like, what if if you can say that maybe Joseph Smith really did believe he was helping people find buried treasure? then maybe David Whitmer really believed Joseph Smith produced the Book of Mormon, but but at some point he fell away. Well, and this is where the that gold plates— That doesn't make it true. Be, well, no, but this is where the gold plates become very, very— because the difference between Joseph Smith saying, oh, I can see buried treasure, oh, it's not there, is David Whitmer saying, I saw a physical object, and I looked at this actual pile of plates that was a real thing that was physical— uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of testimony. I mean, for Joseph Smith to say, well, I believe that God is speaking to my soul and telling me where, where buried treasure is, uh, you can dismiss that as him being wrong. But for David Whitmer to say, I actually saw the physical gold plates, uh, that's a much harder thing to just sort of say, well, he, he thought he saw gold plates. I mean, but this is but this is where this is why the treasure digging becomes important because if you have a magical world view where you can believe that you see treasure buried underground. 
Well, uh, that, that, and that's what these but, men, but, these but, men, no, that's but, who these but, men were. They believed in treasure digging before they believed. So if you can believe that you, if you live in a world where you believe that you can see treasure underground that isn't really there, it's not that big of a stretch to, to believe that these were also men that could believe they saw an angel with plates in their mind's eye, in their second sight, which is... Which was a gen which was a real belief at the time, and it caused all that all these problems in 1838, when when people started asking, "Did you really see this physically?" There were a lot of people that said, "I saw it spiritually. I saw it in my mind's eye," and 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 that all flows. That's why the magical worldview. That's why Michael Quinn wrote the book, right? The the magical worldview, and that's why when B. H. Roberts. Or whoever, you know, if you look, if you read Shannon Caldwell Montes's um, thesis, I don't know if you've read it. I have not. There, there's a there's a member of a first presidency that, or an apostle, or someone important that interviews David Whitmer towards the end of David Whitmer's life, and he really he's an attorney, and he really grills David Whitmer on, did you really see physical plates? He himself in the 1900s comes away disappointed at David Whitmer's inability to satisfy. The 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 material the materialness of his experience. And that is consistent with the apostasy that happens in 1838. And it's consistent with the magic worldview and the belief of second sight. That's not all hooey. That you there's something there's no, something I say, to that. I didn't say that's all hooey, but I think the the the, the idea of the magical worldview. And the idea of second sight and those kinds of things, uh, particularly with regard to D. Michael Quinn, I, I think are templates that have been created after the fact to explain circumstances that fit some of the testimony and very much don't fit some of the other testimony. Uh, the 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 one I, the thesis you described, I don't remember the name of the person, but Jeremy does quote that in the CES letter that the guy who came away disappointed that it wasn't material enough. I did go back and read that when I was responding to it. And, uh, and David Whitmer the next day insisted that, no, it was an actual physical experience. That's when, you, I think it's Martin Harris that said, do you see this bedpost and bangs on the bedpost? This is, that's how real it was. Uh, I mean, th there are so many firsthand accounts by these men where they insist that it's absolutely a physical experience. And David Whitmer gets very angry right before he dies that he publishes a, you know, a letter to all believers in Christ where he reaffirms the physical nature of seeing these plates. Uh, I, I, you have to come back and figure out some kind of, of, of way of explaining that and saying, well, they didn't really see them. And, and it was very common for people to say that they saw things that they didn't really see I'm not convinced of that. I mean, I, I don't know if that makes me a terribly no, obstinate. No, I love it, but I, I'm not convinced that 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 people can say, you know, I'm I'm looking, I'm looking at your shoes, but I, I'm looking at shoes over there too. There are no shoes over there. You know, I'm not looking at shoes over there. I don't know how I can convince myself that I'm looking at shoes. I I I, I don't think the witnesses' testimonies can be dismissed that easily because the vast majority of them firsthand do not lend themselves to the idea that they're just claiming to have seen a vision and second sight and all this. And, and it, one of the things that I got very frustrated with when reading the CES letter is that Jeremy Runnels quotes the same article like five times and each time acts as if it's a different person saying you know, quoting him a different time. It's it's one document that he quotes five times uh, that is a document from a hostile source that insists that David Whitmer told him that he only saw it with his second sight or his mind's eye or whatever else. I mean, it, it, we're getting into the weeds here because I don't know that I'm qualified to, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not citing specific documents, only to say from a broader picture, I really don't think it's as easy to wave away the witnesses as just silly yokels, super, I mean, Dan Vogel offered the idea that they were all hypnotized, uh, which strikes me as really kind of bizarre and strange. And, and I don't, don't think that's something that would endure, uh, you know, 40, 50 years after the fact. So, um, I, I, I really feel, and I think, I, I really believe that 
the Book of Mormon and all of the things surrounding the Book of Mormon uh, are the strongest evidences for the restoration of the gospel. I think that was intended. I think that's what the Book of Mormon's purpose is. I think if I were to leave the church, I would have to sort of find my way around the Book of Mormon. Jo- uh, Jeffrey Holland talked about that. And one of, you know, anybody who leaves the church, they have to go out and around or under the document. Uh, but the Book of Mormon, to me, is a stumbling block in the sense that I, I, I really, if, if I could be convinced of a persuasive secular explanation for that book's existence, then that would be a very severe blow to my faith. I have, I have yet to encounter anything that comes close to that for me. How does, so I think everyone who's credible, uh, a scholar, a believer, acknowledges that, that the Book of Abraham, the, the papyra that, that Joseph Smith um, you know, claimed was written by the hand of Abraham, right. in fact, doesn't have the word Abraham, was not written by Abraham, was not written during the time of Abraham, and has no, no Abraham word anywhere on it. Um, and so the best that apologists can do now is, is the, um, is the theory that, that the catalyst theory that the God put these papyri in Joseph Smith's hands to inspire him to channel the words of Abraham when he misunderstood that, 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 that these were actually Abraham's writings. Why doesn't that add further condemnation to the legitimacy of the Book of Mormon and, and, and the whole enterprise when, when we have an instance where if I had done that, if I had said to you, hey, I'm, I've got this papyrus and it's, it's right. Abraham wrote it and, right. and I, here's all this great scripture. If I had done that, you'd say, John, you're a joke. Egyptologists say that the word Abraham is even on the papyrus. You would write me off as illegitimate and as a fraud. You would. Everyone would. But if Joseph Smith does it, then we're going to create some elaborate explanation that, the, you know, the, the catalyst theory. Why doesn't that add extra condemnation to the whole enterprise? You know, just that, just that alone. Because again, it's not just one thing. It's these 10 things all piling up, right? Um, well, it's the order of the pile, you know, in the, in the CES letter, in his first letter, he had a graphic that talked about, okay, you have the Book of Abraham, which is a fraud. You have the Kinderhook plates, which are a fraud. Uh, and you have, what's uh, the, the other? Joe Smith translation. I don't think he mentions the Joe okay, Smith Okay, yeah, you're right. That came out after. That came out afterwards. But, but he says, you have these three frauds. So why would you buy a, a, a car from someone who'd already th- sold you three clunkers? Yeah. And my response to that was, well, you bought the first car, that fourth car, which is the Book of Mormon, that's the one that came first. The Book of Mormon stands as a testament to Joseph Smith's power as a translator, as a revelator, as a prophet. And so the only reason I give the Book of Abraham any credence at all and pay any attention to it is because the Book of Mormon came first. Uh, and, And I've wrestled with this. Uh, because even when I was on with Bill Real, Bill Real kind of ambushed me because I hadn't heard about um, um, Brian Hauglid's, you know, um, his statement where he rejected his apologetic writings from before and insists that the, the Book of Abraham, you know, the, the papyrus bears no resemblance and all of that. And he just sort of ambushed with that in that conversation and I wasn't really prepared to respond to it. And I have since gone back and looked at it, and, and I've gone back and read what I wrote in my reply. And I actually was very heartened to find that what I'd wrote, written in my reply, uh, I still sort of believed, or pretty much still believe. And in, in that, and this is the Jim Bennett catalyst theory, this is not, um, the, the way I see it is that, um, well, and back, I'll back up just a little bit. Uh, we have Doctrine and Covenant section seven uh, describes the fate of John the Beloved, 
which Joseph Smith insists John the Beloved wrote on an ancient papyrus somewhere. Uh, in Joe, a cave somewhere. In right? a cave or yeah. something on the Isle of Patmos. And, and Joseph Smith never claimed to physically have the papyrus, but insists that he was receiving a revelation that was a translation of that. That doesn't disturb anybody. Well, I mean, it disturbed people who think he's a fraud anyway. But, uh, you know, people don't look at that and go, oh, well, he must have been a fraud. They recognize that that, that kind of revelation is consistent with the kind of revelation Joseph claimed to have. The book of Moses uh, comes from his translation of the Bible. Uh, he never claims to have had a physical anything from Moses, uh, but insists this is something Moses himself wrote. Uh, so so the, the idea that Joseph Smith can receive revelation that is, is a translation. And, and part of the problem, too, is that Joseph would use the word translation. Jeremy got very upset about this in the CES letter, but the word translation, the way Joseph used it, uh, was not necessarily the way that we use it now. I mean, it was sometimes, and sometimes it wasn't. When you talk about translated beings, for instance, you're not talking about uh, translation in the way that anybody in the world would understand what translation means. Uh, but translation wasn't necessarily just rendering something from one language into English. It was receiving these sorts of revelations that you wouldn't have been able to receive otherwise. And that's what we have in the book of Moses in the seventh section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, I think, and I, I, I bring all of my own Egyptological training to this conclusion, which is to say none. <laughs> I have none. Uh, but uh, if you look at, at these ancient funerary texts and you look at the facsimiles and all of these things, um, and you assume that these, as we recognize that these, these papyrus came thousands of years, or at least 1,000, maybe 2,000 years after Abraham, um, I, I think you can make a case that uh, a thousand years is a very long time for symbols that may have meant something else a thousand years earlier uh, to be repurposed multiple times over the period of millennia to the point where there was something ancient that had been repurposed uh, by other people and Joseph the seer can dig out the original from underneath it. And I think there's the possibility that that could have been one of the things that was happening there. I mean, you look at the English language. Uh, if you try to read Chaucer from less than a thousand years ago, it's illegible. It doesn't make any sense. The English language as it exists now has gone through so many changes that you're dealing with symbols that have gone through changes. And, and, I, and I say this without any understanding of any of these symbols. But, uh, but I, I look at that and say, okay, you know, if this is what the Lord needs to do to catalyze Joseph Smith into receiving this revelation, uh, I can accept that within the context of Joseph Smith's track record with the Book of Mormon. If we did not have the Book of Mormon, I would dismiss the Book of Abraham out of hand for all the reasons you describe. But the fact that we have the Book of Mormon demonstrates to me that Joseph Smith's claims to revelation need to be taken seriously. Now, I don't know, um, I, don't, I don't have any idea what the relationship between what Abraham may have written thousands upon thousands of years ago to what Joseph Smith produced as the book of Abraham, if there is any kind of relationship or what any of that is. I do know that I adore the book of Abraham in terms of its content, in terms of the, the, it's from the book of Abraham that we have the doctrinal foundation for the idea of a pre-existence, for the idea of being co-eternal with God that are, that are at the center of my personal faith. So I love the book of Abraham in terms of what it teaches. Uh, I cannot, I cannot claim to say that it has any relationship to that papyrus. I have my own wild Jim Bennett theory that symbols are repurposed over time, but I have no Egyptological standing of that. So, so, so I, you know, and I, I told this to Bill Real, you know, the, the book of Abraham, 
you know, is is uh, the most difficult to defend, I think, because of all the reasons you describe. But the reason I'm willing to defend it and the reason I'm willing to, to give Joseph the benefit of the doubt is because of the Book of Mormon, which I think is much, much easier to defend in terms of, of defending it as indeed the kind of keystone to our religion that Joseph Smith claimed that it was. And the fact that Joseph told people the papyrus was written by the hand of Abraham and the fact that he claimed that he was translating and the fact that he even wrote out the alphabet and the grammar and you could see from the Kirtland Egyptian papers or the, you know, book of whatever Egyptian right, papers right. that, that he's, you know, clearly uh, appearing to go through the process of trying to match symbols to sentences. Right. What do you make of the fact that th your theory means that Joseph didn't even understand what he was doing and thus misrepresented what the documents were and what he was doing with the documents? Does that just go to prophets are fallible? Um, it doesn't just go to prophets are fallible, uh, because it, it says a number of things. It says, well, first of all, it says, yes, prophets are fallible, but it also says that Joseph Smith had enough confidence in his own prophetic calling that he thought that that was an appropriate exercise, that he thought that, that that going through these symbols and trying to sort of crack the code of what he'd received by revelation through scholarship demonstrated that Joseph took his own prophetic calling very seriously. It, it, I, I think it speaks against deliberate deception. Right. I mean, I, I don't know if you want to get into But then the, what about competence? Well, competence, I, I, I think it's clear that Joseph's- or credibility, right? Well, well, those are two does different it, things. Does it make it better- if he thought he was really translating words written by Abraham when we know it wasn't, does that, is that better or worse? Does that say, well, he's it's then it's like the, the fake silver mine. Like right. it's, it's just, he's even is though he, he, he's deluded, <laughs> but he's not credible. You know what I mean? Well, credible credibility and competence are two different things because I, because uh, the credibility of his abilities as a prophet versus his competence, his abilities as an Egyptological translator are two different, two very different things. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't think that Joseph Smith uh, is a credible Egyptologist. I don't think he scholarly understood symbols and ancient hieroglyphics in a way that anybody with Egypt, Egyptological scholarship would. Uh, Joseph Smith claimed that the translation took place by the power of God. He did not claim, okay, I've I've cracked Egyptian. He translated the book. But he of, claimed it was papyrus written by the hand of. He Abraham. did claim it, he, and I think he fully believed that. But he was. But, but I think he was wrong. Yeah. Or, or the, if you go back to the my weird little theory, that uh, there is some kind of ancient antecedent to the papyrus that uh, that we don't have access to. And I mean, that's very convenient, and I don't expect anybody else to agree with me on that. But I, I, I look at it, it's, it's very interesting because writing my reply to, to Jeremy um, got me into the whole idea of what translation is and how translation works. And Jeremy begins the CES letter complaining about uh, King James errors that are in the Book of Mormon. And, and I get the sense from Jeremy, I haven't, I haven't discussed this with him. But I get the sense that he's expecting that, that that language translates sort of one for one in each word cleanly and simply, and it doesn't ever. That, that that's not how translation works. Um, you know, it's the reason why you can't take a novel and stick it into Google Translate. You know, you translate it into Russian and then you translate it back into English, and then it doesn't make any sense anymore. It's because translation requires context and it requires word choices and requires framing all these kinds of things. And so, so you know, I, I think that Joseph Smith naively sort of believed in an idea of translation one-to-one -one, uh, that, that didn't exist when, when the kind of translation he was receiving, the revelation he was receiving, 
uh, was something different. I, I think it shows naivete on Joseph's part. Uh, I don't think it shows deliberate deception. And I think it argues against deliberate deception because if, if he knew it was all a fake and a fraud, then why on earth is he letting everybody sift through it? Why doesn't he burn the, burn the originals? What about credibility? Why doesn't it speak to credibility? Again, if I, if I, because, were, to, because, if I were to claim what he claimed, you wouldn't go, wow, John's still a prophet, even though, even though he got the document wrong and the translation wrong, he's still a prophet. You wouldn't, you wouldn't offer me that generosity. I so, would if you had produced the Book of Mormon first. I don't know. I, mean, I, mean, I, I don't think Joseph's credibility as a prophet. So, uh, so people who read L. Ron Hubbard's whatever text right, he produced, right. people who read the Bhagavad Gita, people who read the Quran, yep. they will just say, this document is so miraculous. It's changed my life. There's some document written in the 1960s that nobody knows where it came from. I forget. It's some new Ur agey. Urantia? Something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Some new agey document that appears in the 1960s. I've met people that uh, this guy that, who have said, that document's so amazing. We don't know where it came from. It must be divine. There's even like this Christopher Namelka guy who's come oh, yeah. up with, with, you know. He sued and I, my father. And I'm just way. saying, okay, well, I've met, <laughs> I've met people that just yeah. like, what? I don't care how, where it came from. It's so miraculous that it's got to be true. That's how is how is your reliance on the Book of Mormon any different from the gazillions of people over time that have viewed their scripture as as inspired and so special? How is yours any different than that? I don't know. I, I one of the things that I um, I have come to as I've gone on my own personal faith journey is that I don't feel any responsibility to debunk somebody else's faith in order for mine to be genuine. I mean, all I can tell you is my own experience and, and, and how I have encountered God through the Book of Mormon. And the encounter that I have had with God through the Book of Mormon is not reliant on the credibility of ancient American archaeology uh, or anything else like that. And even the book of Abraham, the divine wisdom that I have culled from the book of Abraham does not rest on Joseph's competence as an Egyptologist. Uh, but so when you say, when people come, and Jeremy talks about this in the CES letter quite a bit, you know, what do I say to somebody who, who prays and is told that the Catholic church is the right church? I my answer is I tell them, good for you for getting an answer to your prayers. I can't look into your heart. I don't know. I, it, it, I don't have to say, oh, well, you didn't really get an answer to your prayer. Your spiritual experience is invalid. Incidentally, it's a little disingenuous, though, to say that because that, again, is not how a lot of other people frame this. I mean, you don't talk to a lot of Muslims who talk about praying to know if the Quran is true. That's not to say they don't have spiritual experience with, with the Quran or this and that and the other, but they, they just sort of frame that experience. That's that's very sort of Mormon way to frame that experience. We put it in the context of Moroni's promise and assume that the Quran came with its own Moroni's promise too, and it doesn't. But you do have people who say, this is so beautiful, it must have come from God, and I feel God when I read it, and I'm connected to God. Uh, and I absolutely firmly believe that God does not only communicate with people within this church. I believe that he uses the Quran, and he I think he's even capable of using the writings of L. Ron Hubbard. I don't know. I, I find Scientology really fascinating and really scary at the same time, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but the, but the, po the, point is, the point is, what do I say to those people is I say, this is my experience. And if that's of any value to you, then great. And if it's not of any value to you, and you have had your own experience with the divine, you know, God bless you and keep you. Uh, I love that. Um, really quickly, we should touch on first vision. Let me just quickly summarize the the thing I want to target. There are a couple problems with the first vision. One is that like we've been able to identify at least 16 other people that had similar visions before Joseph Smith or during the time of Joseph Smith. 
Greg Prince has even made the point that it, it was almost uncommon for people not to claim some sort of experience with the divine. Right. So we, we're led to believe that Joseph's first vision was some unique, singular kind of thing. Bushman makes the case that one of the reasons why we didn't hear about the first vision is for exactly those reasons. It was it's, just so it, common. It was, it was so common that Joseph was afraid that he would just be lumped in. One with of all, many. One okay, of many. so that's one. The second thing is there's no evidence that he told anybody of it happening for, you know, the 12 years before it actually, you know, so like why didn't he tell anyone? Why wasn't it told as the founding narrative of the church? And then it's fine that I don't even want to get in the weeds of like, Every time we tell a story, it's different, or even that a story can slightly change over time. Right. What's problematic is the fact that, um, in in my mind, that it as it changes, it changes with his own theology. And the main thing that I'm going to highlight is when when he produces the 1832 version that Joseph Fielding Smith hid because he was so afraid of and fearful of that document. When he releases that version, it's when he still believed, like on the lectures of faith, that God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost were one. The Book of Mormon even has a Trinitarian view that God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are one. And so when he tells the story of the first vision in 1832, it's that version of God where it's just the Lord appeared to me. Because in 1832, he didn't believe in God, the Father, God, the Son, as being two separate beings. But by 1838, which is the version that we all look to now, his theology had evolved. And so when he recounts it in 1838, he's adjusting the story to fit his evolving theology. Um, that's It shouldn't change that way, especially when it's figures <laughs> as, as foundational, as essential as deity themselves. Like you would, it you should get the main characters right. Some would argue, and it shouldn't change with your theology. That that's that's kind of too too big, two really important changes that are kind of too big of bridges to cross. And then when you add to that the fact that he didn't tell anyone, there's no record of it for so long. It didn't emerge till 1832, and um. And that, like so many other people were having it, it it starts to challenge the validity of of the claim. Uh, there's a lot there. I'm not quite sure where to start. Um, I mean, I think it's a little silly to claim that he didn't tell anyone because we don't know. We don't. I, Joseph Smith didn't start writing anything down until. You know, 1827 is probably the earliest. But you'd think his mom or dad or brothers would well, say, he yeah, well, he, he, told insists, us, he, he told insists, us this when it happened, but he didn't. Well, we, we, we don't have any record that he didn't. You can't, well, you can't prove a negative. But, but uh, Joseph Smith in his 1838 account insists that he did. He went, well, he, he insists that he told his mother that he was well enough off and that Presbyterianism is not true, uh, but insisted that he started telling people and then got persecuted and, and stopped. Greg Prince thinks that's nonsense. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is the idea that we can definitively say he didn't tell anybody only means that we don't have any written record of it. Which There's is, no evidence which is, of it. Which... Well, but it's, it's a very different thing. I mean, he, we don't have any written record right, of anything right, that Joseph right. Smith did between 1820 and 1827. Uh, we, we don't, we don't, so we, we don't know. And, and, and people point to the Palmyra reflector of 1830 where, they talk about a kid who claims to have seen God a number of times and say that's a reverence to the first vision. And you have the 20th section of the Doctrine and Covenants where he talks about receiving a manifestation that showed the forgiveness of his sins, which is consistent with the 1832 account. But, uh, you know, I, I, the, the idea that we definitively say Joseph Smith didn't tell anybody about this at all until 1832 it just means that we don't have written records of it. And I don't think we should expect written records of it at a time when Joseph was not keeping rec written records of anything. Joseph Smith in 1820 was essentially illiterate. You know, so the idea that we should expect him to have written this down or anybody to have taken him seriously, particularly since this experience was so commonplace as you describe, you know, Greg Prince points out 
that he wouldn't have been persecuted for it because everybody was having these experiences in the woods. They were going out and they were seeing Jesus here, there, and everywhere and all over the place. So, so the, the idea that it would have attracted any attention, uh, that might go to the credibility of the 1838 account where he insists that he was being persecuted for it. But I don't think that, that making the claim, Joseph said, didn't say anything to anybody, is a claim that can be sustained. Now, the idea that his theology is evolving is an interesting one, but it, 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 it's remarkable to me now to go back and you look at one of the interesting doctrinal things that you find in the Book of Mormon, for instance, um, when Jesus appears to the Nephites, there is a voice that speaks to them prior to the appearance. That's the, that's the voice of the Father. And the Father speaks, introduces his Son, and then Jesus appears. Um, you have that same experience on the Mount of Transfiguration in the Bible. Uh, and in the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, it, it retranslates the scripture that says, no man hath seen God at any time, as saying, no man hath seen God at any time except he hath borne record of the Son. And I see the, the I, I again would work backwards in that in that the Book of Mormon, in terms of its plain reading, is far more Trinitarian than anything you'll find in the New Testament. I mean, you have Jesus announcing he is the Father and the Son to the Nephites. You have um, Abinadi's big treatise about uh, you know the son, the very eternal Father will come to visit. And he is the father and the son because of the flesh. And I mean, you, you read these, and, and on its face, those are more Trinitarian than things that you're going to find in the New Testament. You do have the changes where um, Jose, in Nephi, where Joseph Smith talks about, he changes the, you know, behold, Jesus Christ, the eternal father, he becomes the son of the eternal father. But those are no less Trinitarian. To call Jesus the son is no less Trinitarian uh, than to call him the father. And I think that it wasn't until later in his, um, later in his uh, ministry, I guess you want to describe it, that Joseph Smith recognized the significance of differentiating the father and the son as different physical beings. I don't think it mattered to him so much that, that they were two separate physical beings and if, as is the case in the other instances, the father comes only to announce the son and then disappears, and Joseph Smith's interview is with Jesus, then the fact that he records this and he saw the Lord and talked to the Lord, you know, all of our pictures of the first vision show the father and the son standing there, and the father's just kind of a dope standing by the sidelines while Jesus does all the talking. Uh, I, I think it makes sense that the father announced the son and then was done. And so Joseph describes the appearance of the father only when he recognizes theologically that that's significant, that they were two physically separate beings, because I don't think he recognized that as being significant early. I don't think that Joseph evolved from a non-Trinitarian to a, or from a Trinitarian to a non-Trinitarian so much as he recognized the implications of it as he got older and as he more fully understood it. I, I, so I, there are many things that have troubled me in the course of looking at difficult issues in the church, but the different accounts of the first vision just isn't one of them. It's, it's never really posed a problem to me. And I have really found it remarkable that, um, you know, the, the, the fact that they are different versions uh, demonstrates that this is Joseph recalling an actual event. Because when you have a con man that shows up and just sort of, you know, he's got his story and he's sticking to it, uh, you don't see differentiation. You don't see, oh, yeah, it's no, 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 this is exactly what happened and this is my story from the beginning. And, and you, you read Richard Bushman and it's really remarkable to see how missionary efforts, you say, well, you know, this should have been the founding story. This should... Uh, Bushman talks about the fact that the early missionaries didn't talk about Joseph Smith at all. You know, they went and talked about, they were arguing from Bible texts about the great restoration and this, that, and the other. And Joseph Smith's biography, let alone the first vision, just didn't come into play at all. Joseph Smith was sort of the, 
the source for all of this, but what was important was the doctrine. And that's how they did missionary work. And the idea that we now go out and we teach the first vision and the first discussion, that's a kind of a modern way of framing it. It's probably a better way of doing it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's always remarkable to me that a church that is based on the principle of continuing revelation gets really up in arms when things change, when things are different. You know, we do missionary work very differently now than Joseph Smith did. Well, what are we doing wrong? You know, he should have, we should be doing it the way he did it. And it's like, no, the restoration continues. We are gaining further light and knowledge. And so I, you know, it doesn't bother me at all that that's not something people talked about back then because they just didn't think it was that significant in terms of the message that they were called to deliver. They felt it was significant. They believed that the millennium was like next week. You know, these were millennialists who were coming and saying, you need to join this church because Jesus is going to be here on Thursday. You know, I mean, it was a very different approach. And so I, I look at that and think the first vision, the way the first vision is described uh, hasn't troubled me and is not likely to trouble me because I, I don't think um, I, I don't think it's inconsistent with my expectations of what Joseph ought to have been doing or what we ought to have been teaching. Excellent. Um, thank you for that. We're jumping back a bit. I uh, um, Just on to one thing that's, that's covered in the CES letter, the Kinderhook plates. I get a right. sense you don't think much of that as an issue. Well, the Kinderhook plates— just give a quick, a quick response sure, to Sure. The Kinderhook plates really were the one thing that threw me for a huge loop. Tell the, the audience, makers. just give them the 30-second version. So 30-second version is that uh, these plates were found in Kinderhook, Illinois. That's why they're called the Kinderhook plates. They were these very—they aren't very big. They're about that big. Uh, they were bell-shaped. I think there were six of them. And they were brought to Joseph Smith uh, and in the history of the church— there's a paragraph in Joseph Smith's voice, first person Joseph Smith, where he says, I inspected these plates and found them to be uh, the history of the person they were found with, because they were found with a skeleton, I think. And he is a descendant of Ham, who blah, 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 blah. And anyway, I can't wait to translate them. And then the plates sort of disappear from the historical record. But they're published in a, like pictures of them are yeah, published. Yeah, I think, I think they were even on display yeah. in the, in the mansion house in Nauvoo. Um, but I think the people would say the concern is that he kind of declared them to, you know, like he declares, he finds some bones and he says, that's Zelf the white, yeah. you know, Lamanite. Right. He finds the plates and it's like, oh, those are, you know, authentic. Right, right, right. So he's got a problem with, identifying things as authentic that aren't authentic. And, 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 and the Kinder Egg plates would be another example of him basically getting something wrong, right? Well, okay. Identifying something incorrectly. Okay, yes and no. Like the Book of Abraham. Well, the, the reason why I think the Kinder Egg plates aren't a big deal is because I think that uh, they have been brought to our attention by an editorial glitch in how the history of the church was produced. Uh, Joseph Smith never said any of that. Uh, Joseph Smith, uh, we don't have any, you know, firsthand account of him saying anything. What we have is- He may have said that. He may have said that. I think he said something I think he similar. probably did say that. Well, William Clayton yeah. wrote in his journal, we got these plates and Joseph Smith, Joseph uh, says that he thinks they're from this descendant of Ham and he's going to translate them. Um. There, I don't know who wrote the paper, but somebody went through and found, um, examined the Kinderhook plates, and on one of them there's sort of a boat-shaped figure that looks identical to uh, something in the Kirtland Egyptian papers. And the translation of that figure is a guy who's a descendant of Ham, blah, 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 blah. So it's very clearly that there's a relationship between that and that. And what happened, I think is Joseph looked at the Kinderhook plates and saw that figure and said, oh, this, this has got to be a descendant of Ham because I just saw this figure and I can't, oh, this will be fun. I'm going to translate these. And then Joseph gets into it and I don't know at what point Joseph realizes that, I don't know if he realizes it's fake. 
I don't know if he loses interest or who cares. He never produces a translation of the Kinderhook plates. Um, and I actually look at that. <laughs> I look at that to a large degree as, as um, really odd behavior for a fake translator to engage in. Because if Joseph knows that all he can do is make up crap that bears no resemblance to anything on any plates or any papyrus, for him to even entertain the idea of, ooh, I want to translate these too, uh, that's a sucker who's opening himself up to be exposed. I think that demonstrates that Joseph Smith believed that ancient documents could be translated from ancient plates. I think it once again demonstrates Joseph's sincerity rather than his fraudulence. And I think that the fact that we don't have a translation of the Kinderhook plates rec demonstrates that, you know, it, it, it went as far as a single viewing and a single comment that William Clayton writes in his journal. And that gets blown into the, this massive fraud, especially since William Clayton's journal, as was the case in the way the history of the church was written, it was rewritten as if Joseph Smith had written it. You know, I have done this and I have done this. Whereas William Clayton wrote, Joseph said this and Joseph is going to produce a translation. Uh, I, I I don't see anything even deceptive or sinister about that. But yeah, so I'm not framing it as deceptive or sinister um, as much as it's yet another example of him claiming to have these special powers where he can identify things or, you know, but, and, but, and then but, he turns out to be wrong. But he's right? not, but, but the thing about the Kinderhook plates. Because what pretty, you didn't say is that Dudes crew manufactured them yeah, they're frauds. to fool Joseph. Right. And it looks like they probably did fool Joseph. Well, again. <sighs> they probably did. Or the church wouldn't have displayed, put them on display. Right. And they wouldn't have put pictures of them in the, you know, newspaper or whatever they right, did. Right, right. And William McClellan probably wouldn't have written all this down. They probably fooled Joseph. And so it's another example of people thinking Joseph has these special powers when really he, he, he doesn't quite know what he's doing. Well, it's, it's another example of that if that's how you frame it, but that's not how Joseph framed it. If, if we take it at face value and we say Joseph saw a character that was consistent with another character and he used, there's nothing supernatural about that experience. That's Joseph going, oh, all this link, you know, all this Egyptological study I'm doing is about to pay off because I can take this. He's, he's never claiming to have received a revelation about the Kinderhook plates. He's not even claiming that, you know, I, he's not claiming they're legitimate. He's saying, hey, that's exciting. I think I can translate these because that looks like this. And which is, I think, an entirely human response. I think it's actually kind of charming. That Joseph, and, and again, speaks to his sincerity, because if Joseph is a, produces frauds from plates that don't exist, the one thing he's going to do is run as far away from real plates as he possibly can. And the fact that he's not doing that and he's willing to give the, the Kinderhook plates the benefit of a doubt, I think speaks, to, actually in, in, enhances his credibility to me. Uh, if Joseph had made a statement where he was you know, affirming supernaturally that he had a translation of these Kinderhook plates, uh, that would be problematic. Uh, Joseph never makes anything any, anywhere close to that. And when I read The Godmakers, I didn't have any of that context at all. It was Gilbert Scharfs who talked me off the ledge because my father had never heard of the Kinderhook plates when I raised that with him. So, but uh, I, 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 I don't think... It, <laughs> I, I, allowing for Joseph, there isn't even anything in that story that um, that opens the door for the possibility that Joseph was lying or being deceptive. Uh, it, it's I'm saying wrong. Like like um, I, I'm not necessarily claiming intentional deception. No, but just non credible. Like if you if you if you just string it together. It's like you start out with the treasure digging, which I think we would all agree there wasn't buried treasure guarded by spirits. I think we would all agree to that. 
I would agree to that. So we start with that, and he's using the peepstone. Then he goes to the Book of Mormon, which he covers up, doesn't show, in, you know, doesn't have in the room when he's translating it and the anachronisms. Then you go to the Joseph Smith translation, which now has been tied to the Adam Clark commentary. Lots of parallels there. Then you go to the Book of Abraham, which now we know isn't a, isn't wasn't written by Abraham at all, and doesn't you know was it was a false translation. Then you add the Kinderhook plates. You know, some people have accused the CES letter of being a Gip Gal. What's the word? Gip Galish or something? Where you're just throwing all sorts of things to try and swamp and overwhelm people. I think that's a disingenuous argument. I think it is super credible to say. How many times does Joseph Smith have to get something wrong before you're willing to go, maybe there's a pattern here? I mean, that's that's what it, I think for, for people that have genuine, sincere concerns, I think there's enough instances where Joseph Smith gets it wrong to where you you kind of go, I, I see a pattern. I see a pattern. You know, it doesn't have to, and don't, don't do the straw man of like intentional deception. A straw, uh, just, just the claim of he's getting enough wrong to where at some point it starts to throw into question his credibility. Well, you can certainly see that pattern if that's the pattern you're wanting to apply to it. You can see patterns. Not if you're things. wanting to. No, because I don't Because think... that implies that like we're all wanting to drink beer, and no, I've never no, drank no, beer. No, 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 that's not what and I mean. And I'm not trying to cheat that's, on my wife. Like, that, that's, that's not what I mean. I want to believe. Like Tanner Gilliland of Zelf in the Shelf once said, my, my conscience dragged me kicking and screaming Away from my orthodox belief, right? I don't want to believe. I don't want to disbelieve, but but you get enough dots, you start to see a line. Let 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 me let me reframe, because because that's that's not what I intended. Okay, that's not okay. what I meant. Okay. I, I mean, I don't think you wanted to disbelieve. I, I, I and so I look at those same events, and I do not see a pattern of Joseph getting anything wrong. In, in, I mean, I do not see, I think the Book of Mormon is so remarkably not wrong and so remarkably a testimony of his divine power as a revelator and as a prophet that I apply that filter to the Book of Abraham, uh, to the Kinderhook plates, and to the rest of it. And so, so once I get to the Book of Abraham, you look at it and you say, well, it's not a translation of the papyrus. And I look at it and say, but it's not a wrong revelation because it's consistent with the kind of doctrinal majesty that I have found in the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon stands as a testament to Joseph Smith's power as a revelator. So I don't look at the Book of Abraham as something that he got wrong. Now he said, well, but, but he got the, the Egyptian translation wrong. He was wrong about the Egyptian translation. I'm not concerned about Joseph Smith as an Egyptian translator. I'm concerned about him as a prophet. No, he but as a, as a man who is doing what he says he's doing. So it's not, again, that's that's kind of a false bar to say he's not Robert Rittner. I, he he no, never the, said he was Robert Rittner, right? right? Of course he's not an Egyptologist. But he says this document was written by Abraham, and he says I'm translating it from Egyptian into English. It's it's not was he an Egyptologist? It was no. But, is he doing what he says he's doing? But his claim his claim to translate the Book of Abraham was a claim that he translated by the gift and power of God. He was not claiming to have the scholarly credentials or ability to translate it. He believed that that translation would line up with a sort of scholarly translation, and he was wrong about that. But but. It, you have to look at what Joseph Smith, what claims that he's making uh, are the ones that we ought to be concerned about. Because I'm not concerned about Joseph Smith's claims. Uh, I mean, I think we're talking in circles to some degree. No, but, I, I, I get it. But, I'm just but, summarizing. No, we're about to close, I promise. Okay, okay. That, that's fine. But, but, <laughs> but I, 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 mean, I just look at that and I, and I can see how people get there. I mean, I, I want I want to one hundred percent validate. Um, it's suspicious, right? Well, yes, of course. Again, <laughs> of course. I mean, and Joseph even said it was suspicious. Right, right. Yeah, he did. Uh, you know, so 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 one of the great things about the restoration, and I think one of the things that we've gotten right as a church, is that uh, everybody, if 
everybody has to have their own encounter with the divine to make sense of any of this. Yeah. Because there isn't anything that Jim Bennett can say yeah. to anybody who believes or even doesn't believe or anything that's going to 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 convince you uh, in a scholarly kind of way to to ground your life on a life of consecration to a church and to ideals that uh, that are rooted in what Joseph Smith did. Um, unless you have that kind of personal connection to God that tells you that's something you ought to do. Yeah. And, and so, you know, and, and, I, you know, when you're a missionary and you're backed up against a wall and somebody's throwing stuff at you, you, you bear your testimony to them. And, and that's seen as a cop out to some degree. And, and it is to some degree, but it's also, Look, this is the only reason why I'm here, guy. The reason I came across <laughs> the world to knock on your door is because I've had this spiritual experience and this encounter with God, and I'm trying to share that with you. Well, I reject that because Joseph Smith is a fraud and the book of Abraham's nonsense and whatever else. Then more power to you, and I hope you live a wonderful and happy and marvelous life. And that's kind of where I am at this point. Okay, so that takes me to how I want to conclude this part two which is, uh, it's, it's kind of the epistemology conversation right. We're kind of ending as we began, but I just want to, I want to really have you address this. What, what I hear you saying, if I had to summarize everything you're saying from the first two parts, and I don't want to, uh, be too reductive or to, um, overly simplify what you're saying, but kind of, if I had to summarize what I hear you saying is if someone can produce a text or a book that makes you feel super powerful things, right? That makes you feel super inspired and emotions and just like overwhelmed with like really powerful positive emotion. Then, then that basically can, can make all sorts of other things uh, permissible or okay or potentially valid if someone can create a text that produces such emotion. And that goes back to the Muppet conversation, but I want to just address it very, just very directly to conclude. The fact that so many different leaders have created, you know, Jim Jones inspired people to kill themselves. David Koresh inspired people to sit in a building that burned down to the ground and to have all the, their spouses and children die to give their own wives to David Koresh. You know, like... Uh, the 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 history of mankind is is full, replete with men, largely men, that were able to create a text or sermons that inspired people, that made them feel the emotion, that then had them either believe and or do all sorts of things that were irreconcilable with each other. And so, the, and Jeremy does have a section on this, and I just want to conclude with this: our feelings reliable bases or evidence upon which to base, you know, on the one hand, conclusions about the tangible world, but also an entire worldview. When we have so many different clusters of people, many clusters way larger than, than Mormons, basing totally irreconcilable, deeply held beliefs based on their feelings. Do you know what I'm saying? In the end, you're saying the Book of Mormon made me feel super good. And so everything else kind of has to be kind of true. So are feelings reliable to build your whole life around? Are they reliable? They are not, which is why I haven't built my whole life around them. Um, because I, I, I don't think I would frame my experience in that way at all. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, I don't think I read the Book of Mormon and had this marvelously emotional experience. I, I, I mean, I didn't really read the Book of Mormon until I was a missionary. I had read it. I think I'd read it all the way through, but sort of slogged through it like you're supposed to. Um, and, and I can't recall any sort of transcendent moment of this kind of emotional rapture that you seem to be describing. Um, so 
so uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to give you a warmed over Joseph McConkie again. Um, he 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 used to say that nobody God never produces a mindless revelation. He said, uh, you know, the, the Doctrine and Covenants talks about, I will let you know within your mind and in your heart that, yes, marvelous feelings are part of spiritual experiences. Uh, but Joseph Smith described the idea that the Holy Ghost, no man receives the Holy Ghost unless he receives revelations. The Holy Ghost is a revelator. And I kind of wrestled with that because, you know, you stand up, somebody stands up at the end of a really boring sacrament meeting and says, we've had a great spirit here today. And my reaction is, no, we haven't. You know, this was boring. I want to go home. <laughs> and and uh, but there have been moments in meetings where I felt this kind of spirit, and it's it's not even, uh, it's not necessarily even an emotional experience for me. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily even that emotional a person. I didn't. When I was in a bishopric, I was always kind of. Um, frustrated by the fact that I was the only one in the bishopric that seemed incapable of crying. You know, the bishop would, oh, we've called this new scout master and he's going to be wonderful. And I'd just be sitting there. Yeah, yeah, it'll be great. It'll be really good. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I didn't experience it that way. Um, and uh, my own personal faith uh, has has been shaped and molded uh, by personal suffering, that sounds really, really pretentious, but but it's found for when when I have reached for God and tried to find answers, and I've tried to sort of frame them in the way I want them. You know, I can remember when I was in the MTC, I I went to the bathroom because that was the only place I could be alone without a companion. And when I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna kneel down here in this stall, and I'm gonna get my Moroni's promise answer to the Book of Mormon, and I knelt down, and I, you know, you promised me this, and let her rip, you know, and nothing, you know, and I was just furious and frustrated and didn't know what to do. Uh, you know, I, I was looking to sort of frame God and put him in those kinds of boxes, and I think we're taught in the church that we have to put God in in a box, in, in the church box, or in this, you know, Moroni's promise, these are magic words that if you say them, Magically, somehow you will you do all this, uh, but uh, you know, I I put two defining moments. I've talked about both of them sort of in passing, but uh, when my daughter got hurt and I realized just how shallow my faith was, uh, that my faith was sort of rooted in well, I'm going to do all these good things because then God will be nice to me and I'll have a nice life. How transactional my faith was up until that point. And, and I poured out my soul and I was like, you know, why is this happening? How do I deal with this? And, and, and I encountered something larger than myself in a way that I can't, I mean, I, to call it like the feeling of a Muppet movie or whatever else, it just, it, it wasn't even that it was just so wonderful and ecstatic. It was just, it was just. The, the knowledge that I was known, the knowledge that my suffering and the suffering of my daughter and the suffering of my family was known and was validated and was real. And there was there really was a God. There really is a Christ. I, 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 that, that, that was the kind of pure knowledge that flowed into me. And, and then in 2015, when I, I was, I very much... I want to say I wanted to leave the church, but I felt like I had to leave the church over that policy. I thought the church is so wrong on this. I've got to leave. I, how can I stay? And I felt that same sense of being known, that same connection to God, and a very clear, um, I'm going to say feeling. So I guess I'm validating what you're saying, but it was more than a feeling. It was in the mind. It's an understanding, a very clear understanding that this is where God wants me. This is where I am to stay. These are my people. It is my responsibility to suffer with them, to mourn with them, and to make mistakes with them, and to endure the mistakes that we as a people are going to continue to make. You know, we, we, we will correct this mistake, but there will be more mistakes down the road. 
this is where God wants me. And there is a God and this is where he wants me. So that's kind of where my testimony is. So if you start to frame that and say, well, if somebody else produces a marvelous text that makes me feel good, um, I mean, if there is a truer church, my uncle always used to say, if there's a truer church, I'll join it with you. Uh, and I'm looking for truth wherever it is. And I recognize that there is truth outside this church as well as in this church. But I recognize God's hand is in this church. I have seen it personally. I have felt it. That's where my testimony is. So when I'm backed up against a wall, I'm not going to talk to you about ancient American archaeology or Egyptology or kinderhook plates or any of that. Um, uh, I, I don't, at this point, I don't care. And it's kind of flippant to say, and I can, under, I, I can have empathy and compassion for those who do. And, and I do. I mean, that's one of the reasons I wrote my CES yeah, letter reply is, it, well, don't, but it, it, one of the reasons I wrote it is, is guys, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, there is so much here. There is a majesty here. Uh, uh, there, there is power here. There is, there is love. There is divine love and grace in this church. And if you leave it over the kinderhook plates, I just, you're, 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 that makes me very sad. It makes me very sad that you didn't get a chance to get to the good stuff because you bumped into this stupid stuff. And, and so, and as part of that, as part of that, I, um, I don't want to make any claims of exclusivity. I, I have talked to people of faith outside of this church that have brought me to tears, uh, who, who have had majestic, wonderful, powerful experiences with God and have never set foot in, in any of our churches. And it, that's, that's not my responsibility to take that away from them or to cast any, I, I don't understand that. You know, I, I, like you, I was brought up, this is the true church. And, and so you know, I'd say up to maybe even maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, I would have said, well, maybe uh, clearly they're not really having an experience with the divine. Uh, so somehow my own faith was, was, um, dependent on, on discrediting their faith. And I don't feel that at all anymore. I feel exactly the opposite. I think we encourage faith wherever we find it. And if you want to go uh, be a Catholic and find God that way, and and you have found God that way, I am going to cheer you on every step of the way. And I think that's wonderful and marvelous. And if you're going to find God, and, and I don't want you to be deluded by a Jim Jones or somebody else that's going to damage you, you know, I, I because I, I recognize that you're, you claim, you don't claim, you rightly state that people who experience these really destructive experiences are, are saying the same kinds of things that I am. And, and so I recognize the danger in putting your faith or your loyalty to an organization or a person or anything else that, uh, that, can, that can damage you. And that happens in religious circles far too often. But I can only speak for myself at this point in my life, and I can only say that I, I have found God in this church, and I feel like I can bless the lives of others within this church, and I am confident that others can as well. And that's pretty much as, as far as I go. I love it. I'm going to venture to say that this interview is going to help more people stay in the church than than many efforts that others make. Because I think you are one of the best spokesmen I've ever seen for a, a continued commitment to the to the church. So well, bless, bless you, Jim Bennett. Well, that's very you. kind of you. And I'm not done with you. I want to yeah. I want to bring you back for one more interview. Okay. Where we talk about uh, you know, we can talk about polygamy, we can talk about Blacks in the priesthood. We can talk about the LGBT stuff. We can talk about women. We can talk about, you know, people leaving the church, the young people, and kind of just anything else about like maybe what the church can do. Not that they're paying attention, but they are paying attention. Ideas for what the church can do to kind of 
make things better. Okay. So will you come back for one more? Sure. Okay. But uh, but I just I can't tell you how grateful I am for your being willing to have this dialogue with me, and I can't tell you how uh, impressed I am with with uh, your thoughtfulness and your uh, integrity and your generosity and all that. Well, you're very kind. I I'm gonna uh, I. I will say that I very much enjoy having this conversation with you. And I really resent the people who who say that you are the devil and you are this wicked, terrible, awful person. I, I, I really feel, I feel like you have been fair with me I, I, and I feel like I, this has been a great experience. And I, I don't think we agree on a number of things and I don't have any problem with that. And I, I think that... Uh, People who talk to you and are willing and that you're willing to are willing to engage with you, uh, I think are going to have a good experience, and I would hope more people would do that. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I thank appreciate you a lot. Well, if people want to uh, learn more about what you've written, if they want to check out a faithful reply to the CES letter, how do they obtain it? Um, I work for a website called canonizer.com that is currently hosting uh, my latest version of my CES letter reply. I would invite everybody to come visit it. It's a site where we try to find uh, consensus out of controversy. It's still kind of in beta mode at this moment, but, uh, but that's where they can find the uh, CES letter reply. And uh, that's where they can engage me. I've written a number of things on the blog there. So, so yeah, come visit. Or send Can, me an email. Canonizer. Canon, so send me an email at jim at canonizer.com. C-A-N-O-N-I-Z-E-R.com. And I'm, I'm going to get beat up on that for giving that out. But Is there a web page though? Yeah, like, canonizer.com. But is there for for your actual document? Yes. Or is it just at the homepage? Uh, I, I don't know. I actually know if there's a link on the homepage. If you Google okay, Jim just, Bennett CES up. letter reply. It's there. It, it's, I found it. Yeah, it's, it's not hard to find. find. Yeah. And I just want to give a shout out. We didn't even mention this, but CES Letter can be found at cesletter.org. Jeremy, uh, you're a dear friend of mine. You're also a hero to me and super courageous. And I love that. Uh, I love Jeremy and I love you, Jim. And I love just people that are willing to be generous and have grace, but to be thoughtful and and to try and work all this through. And I think we're. I think we contributed something positive today. And Jeremy, thank you. And Jim Bennett, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you guys for part three soon on Mormon Stories Podcast. You're awesome. Support us at mormonstories.org. Become monthly donors if you can. And uh, and your your thing's free, right? Nobody has yeah. to pay for it, right? It's free. It's free. Yeah. So, all right. Take care, everybody. See you soon. Thanks again, Jim. <laughs>